Japan will hold the Olympics, right, this summer? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I hope I hope uh, we can have the Olympics. But, uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. But yeah, it's a shitty situation everywhere. Mm. Yeah, it's a bit subtle. Yes. And also tricky. <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's hope in the summer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we're, let's wait for a few more minutes. Yeah, let, let, let me know when you want to start, Enrico. I, I don't know. Usually there's a lot of people joining just two past the hour. So let's, let's wait. So I see that number is increasing. Yeah, I think Nicola, maybe we can start. I see the number is still increasing, but... Uh... Okay, yeah, we, we can start with the presentation and the technical informations. So, um, hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you here to the second week of our workshop. Uh, I think it's going pretty well. So <clears throat> today... Uh, we have a, another very interesting day, uh, day full of uh, interesting speakers. Uh, first of all, I would like to remind to all of you to join the Slack channel. Uh, Jamila uh, sent the link in the chat. So for whatever discussion that cannot fit within the, the speaking time here on Zoom, can just migrate on the, on the Slack channel. So feel free to use it and ask whatever question you want to the speakers and then uh, yeah, I just remind to the speakers to join there so that we can go on with this discussion. And I, yeah, I will just kindly remind you to keep your, your microphone off for the duration of the talks. And we will have some 35 minutes presentation for each speaker and then uh, mm, a time span of five minutes for questions. Uh, after the break, there will be a discussion session with Diego Blas, so um, keep your questions also for, for this time. Uh, okay, apart from these technical informations, I think that now we can officially start with the fourth day. So the first speaker of today is uh, Professor Shinji Mukoyama. Uh, Shinji is currently a professor at the Yukawa Institute for Theoretical Physics in uh, Kyoto University. He's a well-renowned expert in modified gravity and cosmology. And today he will present uh, minimalism in modified gravity. So Shinji, you can go on. I will give you a five minutes a reminder before the, the end of the talk. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for kind invitation and uh, kind uh, introduction. So today I'd like to talk about uh, minimalism in modified gravity based on uh, my collaboration with uh, these people. And uh, starting with the introduction, and then the, I'll uh, explain what uh, minimally modified gravity is, and then some examples. After that, I'll talk about uh, minimalism in massive gravity before summarizing the talk. Okay. Let me go on with the introduction. Okay. Okay. So why modified gravity? Okay. So the, uh, there are several uh, motivations, and the first one is uh, mysteries in the universe. So if we can replace some of them, uh, that would be great. For example, uh, dark energy, dark matter, uh, inflation, uh, big bang singularity, or maybe cosmic magnetic field. So if we can if we can address uh, these uh, mysteries by modification of gravity, that would be great. Okay. 
A second motivation comes from uh, quantum gravity. So the uh, modification of gravity may help uh, constructing uh, quantum gravity. So superstring theory and the Hojabi gravity and so on, uh, examples like that. And the third motivation uh, may come from the uh, uh, GR itself. Okay. So the, uh, we really want to understand GR and then the modification of gravity may help. Okay. So after all, uh, one of the best way to understand something may be just to break it and then the, then then construct it. Okay. So the, and also the, uh, if, even if the uh, GR is a correct description of gravity, at least at, long, at, at, at a long distance, of course, at short distance, probably we need to modify. Uh, but uh, uh, at long distance, uh, even if GR is correct description, then in order to prove it by experiment or, exp uh, or, or, or observations, the only way to, uh, to, to, to do that is uh, to, to uh, constrain the pos uh, possible deviation from GR. And, uh, a theoretical prediction may help uh, uh, this in this respect. Okay, so the, at least there are three motivations, and uh, from the third motivation, I think it's uh, better to understand GR itself before before modifying it. So the, uh, let me remind you how uh, we can we can uh, count the number of degree freedom in general relativity. Okay, so uh, many of you knows, but uh, uh, probably most of you knows, <laughs> but just in case. Okay. So we start from uh, 10 metric components uh, because we are in four dimensions. And uh, we go to the phase space. Uh, so the phase space would be 20 dimensions. Okay, we multiply uh, 10 by two. Okay. And in order to do that, uh, we need to uh, uh, treat a time uh, in a special way uh, because uh, phase space means the Hamiltonian formula. Okay. So for this purpose, uh, the ADM decomposition is very useful. And uh, uh, we introduce a so-called lapse and the shift and the 3D metric. Okay, in this way, so uh, 4D metric is uh, written in this way. Okay, and then we substitute uh, this metric into the einstein hilbert action, uh, which describes uh, GR. Okay, and this is the 4D curvature, and then the, we end up with uh, this kind of uh, form of the action. Okay, here uh, Kij is a so-called exchange curvature, measuring how constant time surface is embedded in space time. And this includes the uh, time derivative of, of uh, Hij, which is a 3D metric here, but doesn't include the time derivative of, of lapse or, or a shift, okay? This is spatial derivative, okay? And also here, uh, this is a 3D curvature, so this includes the spatial derivative of Hij, but the no, no, no time derivative, okay? And K is a, a trace of Kij. So the, the einstein hilbert action does not include, uh, uh, so time derivative of lapse and shift, so therefore, the, the uh, momenta conjugate to, to lapse and shift are zero, identical. Okay. So this is, they are uh, algebraic, equation, algebraic equations in the phase space. They are, so they are called constraints. Okay. So they, they can reduce the number of uh, uh, phase space dimension. Okay. And indeed, uh, they are so-called first class and the first class can remove uh, to, to, to the group. Okay. So let me re explain what what the first class is and first, what the second class is. Okay. As you know, uh, uh, the first class is always better than second class. And uh, so second class constraint can reduce uh, one phase space dimension. On the other hand, uh, the first class constraint can reduce the, the, the uh, two phase space dimension. Okay. So the, uh, this, uh, and also the uh, first class constraint can uh, actually generate a symmetry. And whenever we have a symmetry, uh, we have a uh, first class constraint, okay? And uh, one first class constraint is equivalent to pair of uh, second class constraints. So in this sense, uh, this is beta, okay? I mean, the, the, the two is one plus one, <laughs> obviously. So the uh, one, one, one uh, first class constraint is uh, as good as uh, a pair of second class constraints, okay? So I think this part, uh, this uh, becomes important later. So please remember, okay? Now, so the, as I said, the, the, these uh, constraints, uh, pi n equals zero and pi i equals zero are first class constraints because uh, when we compute the, the, the Poisson bracket between uh, one of them with the other constraints, they are zero, okay? Because uh, other constraints uh, do not depend on lapse or shift, okay? So that they are first class constraints and uh, each of them can remove uh, two phase space dimensions. And uh, uh, in GR, we have symmetries. So we expect to have uh, more, more, more first class constraints. Namely, uh, we have uh, 4D diffeo. 
So uh, invariance and, uh, and uh, general uh, uh, coordinate transformation. So we have four generators or four DPO. They are, uh, each of them is first class, okay? So in the end, we have four, uh, four plus four first class constraints, okay? So here, eight first class constraints, and uh, each of them can remove uh, two phase space dimension. We started with 20, and then the eight uh, times two should be removed. So we end up with a, a four dimensional physical space space. Okay, this corresponds to two local, two local physical division. Okay, so when we uh, 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 came to the, the, the phase space, we multiply by uh, 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 10 by two. So we should divide by two. Then we end up with two, two local physical degree freedom. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this agrees with the number of uh, degree freedom in gravitational waves, plus mode and cross mode. And, uh, and but uh, what is different is that this is completely nonlinear. Okay, fully nonlinear. I mean, so uh, gravitational waves is, is a part of the analysis. So that uh, we have two plus and cross modes, but uh, uh, this statement is completely nonlinear and the nonlinear extension of the usual statement. Anyway, so that we know in the in our universe we have G, uh, we have gravitational waves. So the uh, minimal number of uh, degree freedom when we modify gravity from GR should be two. At least we should have a uh, uh, gravitational waves. Okay, the question here is uh, this one. So can we saturate this minimal number? Okay. And the uh, theory is that such a modified gravity uh, that sat saturates this number uh, is called uh, minimally modified gravity. Okay. And uh, so I'd like to explain what the minimally modified gravity is. Uh, so question related to the previous question is this one. So is general relativity unique? Okay. So if the answer to this question is yes, then the uh, question, uh, answer to this question would be no, of course. So the, uh, it's important to ask this question. And uh, a famous Lovelock theorem, I tend to say yes to this question and no to the previous question, okay? If we assume uh, four assumptions like this, four dimensions and the diffeo invariance and the metric only, and uh, up to second order equation of motion of this form, Okay. Also, the effective field theory or uh, directed expansion, I tend to say yes uh, at low energy if we assume uh, these three, okay? Four dimensions and the different invariance and the metric only, okay? So under these assumptions, uh, when we try to find the uh, action of the gravity, which is written in terms of the metric and, uh, and its derivatives, uh, we can start from the, 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 the term without derivatives, and the scalar made of metric is just a constant. This corresponds to uh, a cosmology constant. With fast derivative, no, no terms, because uh, we know that the crystal field is not tensor. And uh, with two derivatives, we can find uh, a, I mean, a rich scale. So uh, this leads to einstein hilbert action. Okay? If we truncate at that point, we, we end up with zero. Okay? So the effective field theory tend to say yes, but uh, uh, wait a moment. So, the, however, the cosmological backgrounds uh, break uh, for the DFO. So, and uh, therefore, maybe we can uh, relax this assumption, this assumption, second assumption. Maybe we can try to find theory uh, without 4D DFO, but uh, with uh, only a uh, 3D DFO. Okay. And uh, so, but if we try to find such a theory, we typically end up with a uh, three degree freedom instead of two. So we cannot saturate the, the minimal number, okay? Uh, for example, in scalar tensor theory or EFT inflation or dark energy or Hodel lift gravity, we have three degree freedom, okay? Let me explain this by, by simple example, scalar tensor theory uh, described by this covariant action, okay? This is a 4D scalar, uh, rich scalar multiplied by some function of scalar field, phi, and uh, the rest of the action is uh, some function of uh, x, which is uh, uh, dm phi dm phi divided by, uh, multiplied by one, minus one half, usual kinetic term, and the phi, okay? And uh, of course, this has a three degree freedom, usual uh, gravitational waves, plus more than cross mode, and the scalar, scalar waves, okay? And uh, let's uh, adopt the, the ADM decomposition that we have learned already. So lapse and the shift and the 3D metric, and substitute these two here and here, and also here. And uh, then the, let's adopt the so-called unitary gauge, assuming that uh, 
uh, derivative of phi is time-like. Whenever uh, derivative of phi is time-like, we can choose a uh, time coordinate so that it agrees with the scalar field phi. Okay. Then the uh, phi here it becomes just a time, and the phi here is just a time, and x here uh, becomes uh, just this expression. Okay, within terms of the, the, the part of the metric, memory lapse. Okay, so plugging all of them here, we get action like this. So the action is written in terms of the metric only. So this is a metric theory. Uh, so that in a sense, scalar field is hidden there. But we know that the number of degree freedom is three because this is just equivalent to this. Okay, so as I said, the, the if we try to find the theory uh, with 3D diffio, without, uh, without 4D diffio, then we typically end up with three degree freedom. Okay, so the real question here is this one. So is GR unique when we assume the following uh, four assumptions? Okay, four, four dimensions and uh, three diffio instead of four diffio, and uh, metric only, and uh, two local physical degree freedom, which corresponds to two polarizations of transverse stress stress gravitation waves. Okay, this is the question that I want to ask. I hope this question is clear. Okay, and the answer turned out to be no, namely that there are theories, uh, some theories that satisfy, no, uh, that satisfy these uh, four uh, uh, properties and that are not GR. Okay, we call them minimally modified gravity theories. Okay, so let me explain some examples. Okay, uh, some examples of type one and type two minimally modified gravity. Okay. And, uh, but in order to do that, I need to explain what type one is and what type two is. Okay, so let me explain this. Okay, by using the, the, the uh, simple uh, scalar tensor theory. Not yet minimally modified gravity, just the uh, uh, scalar tensor theory. Okay, and uh, so this is a, a, a action of a uh, simple uh, scalar tensor theory in the so called Jordan frame. And this frame is sometimes called the matter frame because in this frame, matter action is very simple. Okay. Matter just coupled, minimally coupled to, to, to the metric, okay, uh, G, J, okay. And, but uh, uh, gravity action is a bit, a bit uh, complicated because uh, Einstein, so uh, what looks like Einstein with action is multiplied by a, a function of scalar field, okay. So the propagation of, of the metric and, and uh, is a bit modified because of the scalar field, okay. And, but, uh, uh, we can uh, slightly change the description by doing the so-called conformal transformation of this form. Omega here is the same as omega here, okay? And then the, this part just becomes uh, uh, Einstein reduction, okay? Looks like GR. And do we call this theory GR? Actually, no, because this is equivalent to this, and this is a modified gravity, okay? And, but in this description, uh, which is uh, often called Einstein frame. Uh, in this uh, frame, uh, gravity is modified because matter action is modified, okay? Matter couples to not only to the metric, but also the scalar field with this combination, okay? So when uh, matter is excited, then the, this produces not only the, the wave of gravity, uh, gravity, but also the, the excitation of scalar field. They propagate and then the reach a defined point, And then the matter there, I feel this combination, okay? In this way, gravity is modified in this uh, description, okay? So the uh, so, uh, gravity is modified because of non-trivial matter coupling. Let's call this kind of uh, modified gravity type one, okay? But uh, there are more general scalar tensor theories where there is no Einstein frame. Let's call them type two, okay? So the, uh, let me repeat, type one, there are no Einstein frame. Ah, sorry, <laughs> opposite. Okay, type one has Einstein frame. And uh, so the, this, this kind of theory can be recast as GR plus extra degree freedom plus matter, which couples non-trivially by change of matter, a change of variables, okay? And uh, uh, type two, no Einstein frame, and cannot be recast as GR plus extra degree freedom plus matter by any change of variables, okay? So the, any modified gravity can be classified into either type one or type two. Very simple, okay? Let's remember, uh, remember this classification, okay? So let's consider type one minimally modified gravity based on this classification. So the, uh, by, definition, minimally uh, by definition of uh, minimally modified gravity, 
a number of local physical degree freedom, freedom is two. And by definition type one, there exists an Einstein frame. Therefore, uh, this kind of theory can be recast as GR plus matter, which couples non trivially by change of variables. Okay. Uh, this follows just by definition. Okay. And uh, we can construct uh, all type one minimally modified gravity in a systematic way. Okay. Very simple description. Okay. So the, um, because of this fact, and uh, also the, because of the fact that the most general change of variables is chemical transformation, as far as I know, by combining these two, we can generate any type one minimally modified gravity uh, from GR by chemical transformation. Okay. So the, uh, we can start from GR, then perform the, 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 the chemical transformation of any type, then put matter. That's it. Okay. But if we do that uh, in a naive way, then we end up with an uh, inconsistent theory. Because uh, if we add matter just after chemical transformation, then the, it breaks DPO. Okay. Because before adding matter, a DPO is hidden. Okay, it's not obvious because we perform the chemical transformation, and uh, but the DPO is there, it's hidden. But add, by adding matter, then the, uh, we break uh, DPO because matter thinks that uh, uh, matter itself uh, has uh, has uh, some some DPO invariance, but uh, matter thinks that the DPO is trivial. Okay. On the other hand, gravity part has a DPO which is uh, non-trivially realized. So then the like put, put them together, they are inconsistent. Okay. DPO is broken. And the uh, first class constraint is downgraded to second class because symmetry is not there or, uh, anymore. Okay. And uh, then the first class uh, uh, previously, I mean, uh, re I mean, removed two, degree, two phase space dimension, but now can remove only one because this is now second class. Then we end up, we end up with the extra degree freedom in phase space. This is inconsistent. Okay. So the, but uh, there is a simple way out. We can just gauge fix after after chemical transformation but before adding matter okay then the first class constraint splits into second class constraints because adding uh, cons i mean adding the gauge fixing condition gauge fixing condition plays a role of uh, constraint by itself and the uh, original first class constraint becomes second class we have second we have pair of second class a pair of second class constraints is as good as one first class constraint okay so that's good okay so matter coupling after chemical transformation and gauge fixing so the uh, pair of second class constraints remains. That's okay. That's as good. That is as good as first class constraint. So this is consistent. In this way, we can generate all type one minimally modified gravity. Okay, and uh, and there are uh, many possibilities, but uh, I, I want to show only one example, which is simple. And uh, so this is uh, 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 what we call the uh, f of h, because uh, uh, constraint uh, uh, kind of. Uh, Analog of Hamilton constraint in this theory is a, a, a nonlinear function of the, 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 the Hamilton constraint of the GR. Okay. And in the absence of a matter, this is, of course, equivalent to a, a Hamilton constraint with a cosmology constant. And the cosmology constant is, is, is provided by the root of a function, this function f. Okay. But in the presence of matter, this is different from GR. And actually, this can fit the, the, the uh, 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 Prang data better than lambda CD. Okay. And uh, uh, for example, this is uh, some, some simple parameterization. And we found the, the, the uh, deviation from lambda CD. And the chi square is better there. Chi square is uh, smaller, of course, this. And fit is better. Okay. So the, let me go on to the, the uh, type two because I don't have many, uh, much time. Okay. And uh, so type two, minimally modified gravity by definition, have a uh, uh, to physical, local physical degree freedom. And uh, uh, there are no Einstein frame. And uh, therefore cannot be recast as GR plus matter by any change of variables, okay? Is there such a theory? Actually, yes. One example is a minimal, minimal theory of massive gravity, which I will explain later. And uh, another example is uh, uh, what we found uh, 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 in this paper, and uh, which we, uh, we call the VCDM because this can replace the lambda in the lambda CDM by, by free function of uh, auxiliary field, phi, okay? Phi is like a scalar field, and, uh, uh, but uh, uh, this is non-dynamical. So this doesn't introduce extra degree freedom, okay? So construction is very simple, okay? 
This is very similar to uh, uh, type one, but a bit, bit uh, different. Okay. Well, we start from Hamiltonian GR uh, with three plus uh, one decomposition, namely ADM decomposition that we have learned. Okay. Then we perform a canonical transformation to a new frame. Then the, uh, if we add a gauge fixing and then the, then the other matter there, that is a, a type one, but we don't do that. What we do is add a, to add a cosmology constant instead of matter. Cosmology constant is a new frame and uh, then gauge fix. And instead of staying there, we come back to the original frame, okay? So we perform inverse canonical transformation back to the original frame and then the perform the original transformation to Lagrangian. Then we can add a, a minimally coupled matter field. So we start from GR, we make a trip, then we pick up something and come back. That's the, the construction of this. Then we end up with, we end up with this kind of theory. And recently, uh, at, that, at, that, at the time of uh, this paper, uh, we thought that this should be type two because we couldn't find the frame, I mean, Einstein frame, but uh, we didn't have a proof. But recently we have a proof that this is indeed type two, namely there is no Einstein frame. And uh, also uh, it turned out that this theory is equivalent to the so-called Cascotum uh, proposed by, by, by Nyesh and, 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 and uh, his, his collaborators some years ago. And, uh, but what is nice about this is that uh, uh, this uh, function V of phi can be deconstructed from a uh, 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 freedom and background. So if we give a upper expansion rate as a function of time or, or a rate shift, then the we can give, a, a, so any function of H of Z, as far as the inverse expanding, we can reconstruct the potential, okay? Then the, we can uh, test this theory with, uh, by, by using data. And uh, uh, indeed, uh, we, we, we have recently seen that uh, uh, this can reduce, uh, this theory can reduce H not tension and the uh, speed of gravitational waves is exactly one, and there are no extra degree freedom. So we don't need to worry about the solar system test and so on, okay. And recently, uh, I will talk uh, later, but uh, uh, we extended this theory, anyway, the, the, the uh, VCDM, which is equivalent to Cascotum, to uh, a, a, a bit uh, more general theory, which can address not only H not tension, but also S H tension. Okay, so let me explain how to how we show that this theory uh, uh, is indeed uh, uh, Einstein. Uh, so there is no Einstein frame, namely type two. Okay, so for this purpose, it was useful to to, to define uh, refine the classification. We already know that there are type two, type one, and type two. Type one have Einstein frame. Type two do not have Einstein frame. Okay, we also introduced in this paper type A and type two, a uh, type B. So. Type A have usual dispersion relation for gravitational waves with uh, uh, including the speed of gravitational waves, namely the coefficient in front of K squared, okay? And type B have modified dispersion relation, either uh, speed of gravitational waves is different from one, or uh, we have uh, defined terms in the dispersion relation, like a gravitational mass or, or higher order uh, terms, K to four and so on, okay? And so we have four, four types, okay? A type, uh, type 1A, type A, 1B, type 2A, type 2B, okay? And the proof of the absence of Einstein frame in the Cascotum or, or VCDM goes like this, okay? So we analyze uh, gravitational waves in this theory, and we show that the dispersion rate, I mean, speed of gravitation waves that, uh, like, like, uh, is one, namely that we have a standard uh, dispersion relation. So the, this theory is either type 1A or type 2A, okay? This or this. And we want to show that this is indeed this one. So that we uh, try to find all type one A theories, okay? So that we performed a general conformal type uh, canonical transformation, okay? From GR, because if we do the kind of this formal type canonical transformation, then we end up with type two B, a uh, type one B, okay? So we perform this uh, general transformation, which is conformal. Then the, uh, we end up with, we found the most general type one A uh, minimally modified gravity. Then we compared this with uh, uh, this new theory, okay? So we, for this purpose, we analyzed the, the Bianchi one universe, vacuum Bianchi one universe, which is simple enough to analyze. Then the, we found a uh, difference between this theory and uh, this most general type one A, minimally modified gravity. We cannot reproduce dynamics of this. So that this means that uh, uh, this theory is not 
of type 1a. So combining this and this, we end up with the conclusion that this theory is type 2a. Therefore, there is no Einstein frame. Therefore, we are finally populated uh, this uh, 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 new type 2a, uh, two, uh, two a, yes. Yeah. So in this way, we prove that there, uh, there is no Einstein frame. OK. And recently, uh, we, we extended the, the, the VCDM, and, uh, which is equivalent to uh, uh, Cascoton, to a new theory, which can accommodate the weaker gravity for dark matter. So this may, 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 may address uh, not only the age not tension, but also SA tension. Okay. But uh, probably I don't have time. And uh, because I want to talk a little bit about uh, mass gravity. But the uh, point is that here, I mean, uh, we see them, we, we, we started from GR, we, we make a trip, then we pick up a uh, cosmology constant and came back. Uh, but here we pick up not, on, not only a cosmology constant, but also dark matter. We can put any, any uh, dark, dark matter action, any, any particle dark matter or whatever, then they come back. Then the, we can find that the, 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 the uh, effective gravitational constant for dark matter is different from, uh, from uh, a GR. On the other hand, standard model have the usual gravity and also speed of gravitation wave is one. So they, they, they are good. So we can easily pass the, uh, 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 say, say the, the solar system experiment and also, also the constraint from the uh, gravitational waves. But we can, we can address, probably address H not tension and the H tension. So this is a new theory okay, of, of type 2B, type 2A. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'd like to talk about the uh, 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 last uh, uh, subject, which is uh, minimalism in, um, in, in, in massive gravity. Okay. So the uh, massive gravity has a relatively long history. So let me remind you the, the history. So the, uh, I put here a, a, a CISO or, or branch because uh, uh, answer to this simple question turned out to be time dependent. So the question is, can we give a mass to graviton? Okay. And first answer was yes. Otherwise the history didn't start. <laughs> and uh, the first answer was given by Fias, uh, Fias and Pari uh, in, in 1939. And they found a unique theory without instability. Unique in the sense that we have only one additional, uh, one additional, const, additional parameter compared to GR. Okay? Additional parameter is uh, graviton mass. Okay? Now, uh, uh, after a few years, some years, uh, uh, VDVZ uh, came up and they, they said no. <laughs> okay? So they consider the massless limit of this theory. As I said, there are only one additional parameter, which is graviton mass. So naively, if we send graviton mass to zero, we, we naively think that the uh, GR should be recovered, but they said no. They found a discontinuity and difference from GR in the mass estimate is order one. And uh, therefore, uh, if the, 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 their conclusion is correct, uh, not, only mass, uh, not only mass mathematically, but also physically, then the uh, mass of gravity would be excluded, excluded by experiment. experiment. However, gravity mass, uh, uh, however uh, small gravity mass is. But two years later, Weinstein came up and uh, uh, the, he said that uh, uh, linear theory breaks down in the massless limit. So we should take into account nonlinearity. Then the, if we do that, then the massless limit agrees with GR. So the, he saved, uh, saved the, the, the massless gravity. But in the same year, uh, Borovia did, uh, came and uh, they said no <laughs> again. And uh, so they said that the, because of the same kind of nonlinearity, uh, uh, so we, we end up with the extra degree freedom, okay? So Fias Power found a nice, nice, nice theory by kind of fine tuning, and, uh, but uh, uh, this fine tuning is attuned by, by nonlinear, at the nonlinear level. And uh, we have uh, extra degree freedom, it, it is, uh, which is ghost. And they, it, that is called BD ghost or Borovia delta ghost. And uh, for a while, people believe that there is no way to give a mass to gravity. But in 2010, fortunately, uh, Drama, Gabadate, and Tore uh, came and uh, they, they, they found the first example of nonlinear mass gravity without BD ghost. Okay, so we now know the answer to this question. Uh, uh, at least we have a theory uh, like this. Okay, so the, now time to ask the second question Can we have acceleration without the dark energy? Uh, Shinji, uh, you have five yes. minutes left. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I'll try to speed up. Okay, and uh, so then the uh, but the first, unfortunately, the first answer to, to this uh, question was uh, no, but <laughs> they found a no good result. They found that there is no flat free universe. 
So the consistent theory, but no viable cosmology. At that time, I, I, th this is the time when, 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 when I started to think about this theory. <laughs> Bad timing or good timing. But uh, fortunately, I found a way out. So the fortunately, uh, uh, open universe is OK. So we can find the open universe, although uh, flat universe and the closed universe are, are not, the, uh, not there. Also, slightly extending the theory, we can find any type of freedom. Okay. And, uh, but uh, in, the, in the year after, we found, I mean, as you can expect from this uh, uh, seesaw or balance, uh, this, uh, I mean, change, uh, answer change from good, bad, and so on. And uh, we found a kind of uh, nonlinear instability. Okay, this is not uh, BD ghost, this is not huge ghost, this is a new type of ghost. Okay, and so we, we were kind of happy because we found a new phenomena in massive gravity. But uh, at the same time, we felt sad because we killed our, our own solutions. <laughs> and naturally, we tried to find a new, uh, new, new uh, way out. One possibility is to find a new type of uh, solutions in the same theory. Uh, but another possibility is to find uh, a new theory, okay? To extend the, 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 the DRGT theory, okay? And uh, so this is uh, one example, minimal theory of massive gravity. And so this is, uh, this is where minimalism came, um, uh, 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 is important so that we found a theory uh, with two physical degree freedom, uh, which corresponds to uh, massive gravitational waves. Okay, so this uh, this has a nice uh, exactly the same uh, freedom and background as in the RGT. So we can find uh, uh, we can have acceleration without the dark energy. There are no BD ghosts, no 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 Higuchi ghosts, no nonlinear nonlinear ghosts that we found. So absolutely stable. And also their uh, positivity bounds does not apply here, okay? Uh, obviously I don't have time to explain, but uh, uh, construction is very simple, at least conceptually. Uh, we can find this theory just by three steps from the RGT, okay? And uh, uh, finding a, a good theory, we can try to fit the data. Indeed, uh, uh, there are two branches of cosmic solutions. One is the self, self stadium branch, but the perturbation behaves like a lambda CDM. So the fit with the data is not, not, bit, not very good. But in the other branch, which we call normal branch, uh, can fit the, the, the data a little bit better. So the uh, RS data can be fit a little bit better. We have two minima of the, the chi-square, this one and this one. Both have a little bit better fit. And also, if we apply this theory uh, to, to our universe, we can find uh, something interesting, okay? So the, uh, in order to do that, we need to slightly extend the theory uh, so that the uh, graviton mass is time dependent. Okay, so we can uh, have a large graviton mass during inflation so that it can change the spectrum of gra gravitational waves, but that should be small at present time to satisfy the bound. Okay, and uh, during inflation and slightly uh, for, for a while after inflation, after the heating, but before BBN, uh, graviton mass is supposed to be large, then the drops to small value. Okay. During this period, uh, when gravitational mass is large, the, 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 the uh, grav um, grav uh, energy density of gravitational waves scale like uh, A to minus two, because this is massive, okay? Instead of uh, one of A to four, uh, this uh, decays slower. So compared to GR, the amplitude of gravitational waves enhance. Also, because this is uh, massive during inflation, the IR part is suppressed, meaning that the uh, spectrum is blue. So that after imposing CMB constraint, we can have a large amplitude at, at, at the large, I mean, these this smaller scales so that we can detect, uh, potentially detect the, 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 uh, this kind of gravitational waves. Okay, so this is interesting. So the minimal theory of mass of gravity would be one, one possible way out of this. And the minimalism uh, uh, works very well. Okay, and also the, uh, we can try to extend uh, the, this, uh, this theory has a, 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 a one physical metric and uh, the another metric, which is called fiducial metric, and uh, the another metric is uh, non-dynamical, as in any, any, any massive gravity. But we can try to uh, promote to a dynamical field so that we have two metrics, okay? Two dynamical metrics. So we end up with a uh, bi-gravity, which we call the uh, minimal theory of bi-gravity. Here we have four physical degree of freedom corresponding to massless graviton and uh, massive graviton. There are no other degree of freedom. So the, uh, there are no uh, instability, absolutely stable. And, uh, and uh, the background, freedom of background is exactly the same as Hassan Rosen by gravity. 
So we can have uh, acceleration without uh, dark energy. And uh, so this uh, is a very fast example of uh, completely stable and the cosmologically viable theory of nonlinear uh, non by gravity. And uh, this can provide, uh, uh, serve as a testing ground for gravitational phenomena, such as uh, graviton oscillations. And uh, that this can be tested by, by gravitational waves. And uh, so in this sense, uh, 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 this can be uh, uh, also another way out. And uh, minimalism plays a very important role here. Okay, so let me summarize. Okay, so probably I don't have time, so I, I'll stop here. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks to you, Shinji, for the very interesting talk. So I think we have some time for a very quick question. So I would ask if somebody has a question to raise his or her hand. Um, yeah, I see Mario has a question. So Mario, go on. Thanks, Nicola. Hi, Shinji. Very nice talk. It was very interesting. I have just a question about a, <clears throat> a point that you commented uh, quickly. That you said that this new theory of massive gravity actually uh, positivity bounds does, do not apply to the to it. Uh, can yeah, you shortly explain why? Yeah, because this is a, uh, this has a Lorentz violation. <laughs> Indeed. Ah, okay, as simple as that. Fine. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Very simple, simple answer. Thanks. Okay, this was quick enough. So, uh, if there aren't any other questions. Maybe we can continue later in the discussion session after the Nicola, can, I, can I ask a very quick one as well? Yeah, yeah, Rico, go on. At some point, you said that uh, I think it was the type two minimal extension of GR, that, and that's equivalent to Cuscuton. And you said it has two degrees of freedom. So I'm a bit confused by, by that because Cuscuton does have an additional degrees, degree of freedom, right? Uh, no, it doesn't have this. Because. I mean, I thought for his Cuscuton with the quadratic potential is equivalent to Hojava gravity with just small lambda, just the term multiplying k. And there are uh, in a sense, yes. So, so Hojava gravity with the lambda exactly one, small lambda exactly one. Small lambda. So the, if if the if the, I mean yeah. So that's 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 the difference. Yes. I see. Okay. Well, may, maybe I'll, I'll ask you later in. in... Yeah. I'll take a look at the paper. Thanks. Sure, sure. We have another, another, another extension, this one. So. I see. No, I was just confused by because. Yeah. Uh, let, let me take a look. Maybe I'll get back to you. Sure, sure, sure. Yes. Okay. So if there aren't any other questions, I would like to thank Shinji again. And we can move on to the next speaker who is uh, Lavinia Eisenberg. Uh, hi, you Lavinia. I'll stop uh, hi. sharing. Yes, thank you. Hi, Lavinia. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> so um, while Lavinia starts sharing her screen, I will briefly introduce her. So Lavinia is currently a professor at the Institute of Theoretical Physics at the ETH of Zurich and her works cover a large uh, range of topics in modifications of gravity and fundamental physics. And today she will uh, instruct us on how to play with geometry. So again, uh, as I said to Shinji, I will give you a brief reminder five minutes before uh, you finish your talk. So you can start now. All right, thank you very much for having me here. Um, so I will today, today not talk so much about modified gravity, but maybe uh, just mention uh, a little bit in this direction. So today I would like to talk about geometry and how we can use it to describe gravity. So I would like to start with general relativity. Um, so um, how can we introduce it using geometry? And for that, I will start just the way how Einstein um, thought about it. So Einstein uh, postulated that gravity is a property of space-time and that gravity is geometry. So the way how he visualized, you could imagine it, um, imagine you start with a flat space-time and now you put a massive object on it, like the Earth, 
due to this massive object, the space time gets curved. And now if you have a second object like the moon, it feels the gravitational um, force due to, the, due to this curvature of space time. So compared to the Newtonian perspective where Newton uh, postulated that there is actually a force that immediately propagates from here to here, Einstein completely gave up on that perspective and said, no, no, gravity is actually due to curvature of space time. So in Einstein's perspective, general relativity equals to the curvature of space time. So within this geometrical uh, interpretation of gravity, uh, you could then ask, is this geometrical description unique? Um, could we also describe gravity using other properties of space time? And so this is not unique indeed. And uh, this will allow me to introduce the geometrical trinity of general relativity. So I will then try to introduce the same theory of general relativity from three different um, interpretations or perspectives. The first one is going to be the same as uh, Einstein did, so Allah Einstein, based on curvature. But then I will introduce the second um, completely equivalent and independent formulation of general relativity, this time based on torsion. This is the teleparallel equivalent of general relativity. And finally, I will introduce a third completely independent um, but equivalent formulation of general relativity and this time based on non-metricity. And this is going to be the coincident general relativity. So maybe for those who are not so familiar with this um, additional geometrical objects like torsion and non-metricity, what do they actually physically represent? So you're already probably familiar with what um, curvature does. So Imagine um, you have a vector pointing towards a given direction and you move it as a, along a closed path and you come back where you started. But if this vector now points towards a different direction than you started with, then you know that your space time has a non vanishing curvature. How about torsion? Um, now, if you have two vectors and you parallel trans transport them along each other, and if this parallelogram doesn't close, then you know that there is a non-vanishing torsion in your, in your space time. And finally, non-metricity, um, what it does is if you have a vector and you move it along a given path, the length of the vector changes um, if your space time has a non-vanishing non-metricity. Okay, so let me then start with general relativity a la Einstein, just so for comparison, I know that you are all familiar with it. So in, in this case, we have a pseudo Riemannian manifold. So our fundamental object is just a metric, this symmetric metric you may knew here. And um, the connection is entirely given in terms of the Christoffel symbols. Um, which are here expressed in terms of uh, first derivatives acting on the metric. So it's, there aren't any additional degrees of freedom associated to the connection. So you live in a space time, which is uh, curved and, but torsion is zero and non-metricity is zero. So you have to work with the curvature tensor with the Riemann tensor and here I'm just giving the expression of the Riemann tensor. As you see, it has some derivatives acting on the Christoffel symbol. So you have here second derivatives acting on the metric and you have some Christoffel squared part. And so you have a tensor here with four indices. You can contract the indices to build a scalar quantity, no problem. And in this way you obtain uniquely the Einstein-Hilbert action. So in this formulation, um, as I said, due to this terms here, you have second order acting on the metric. And um, in terms of the variational principle, um, this can then cause problems if your, if your manifold has a boundary. So you need to add the Gibbons-Hawking your boundary term 
um, in order to have a well-posed variational principle. Let me then move on to the teleparallel equivalent of general relativity. This time, as I said, this formulation is based on torsion. So um, now your fundamental object is the connection, is not the metric anymore. And the connection has this important uh, piece here uh, in terms of the contortion tensor. And so you now live in a space time which is completely flat. So the Riemann tensor vanishes um, and also the non-matricity tensor vanishes and only torsion um, is the unique geometrical object. Um, here is the definition of, of the torsion tensor in, in case you are not familiar. So it's the antisymmetric part of the connection. So it's antisymmetric in the menu indices. Um, so because it is um, antisymmetric in the menu indices and because this is also, it has three uh, indices, right? So you cannot build a linear scalar out of that. You need to go to quadratic order in the torsion. And because it is antisymmetric, you can have three independent um, three independent contractions at quadratic order in the torsion. So here I am uh, writing this one, two, three independent contractions that you can have um, for the torsion tensor with C1, C2, and C3 parameters being some arbitrary parameters. Um, but of course, you need to also introduce some Lagrange multipliers in order to really make sure that you live in a completely flat space time so that Riemann tensor vanishes, curvature vanishes, and that non-metricity vanishes. And only if you choose these parameters in this very specific way, you obtain an equivalent theory to general relativity. So only really for these very specific uh, parameters, uh, you have general relativity. And if you want to compare basically these two formulation uh, of this quadratic torsion uh, action or torsion scalar to the richest scalar of the Einstein-Hilbert action, which is basically um, given in terms of the Christoffel symbols, you see that they are equivalent up to some total derivatives. So um, at the level of the equations of motion, they give rise exactly to the same equations, but at the level of the Lagrangian, they differ by the total derivatives. So let me then move on to coincident general relativity, this third completely independent uh, formulation, which has quite some uh, uh, intriguing properties. So now this manifold is based on non-metricity um, your fundamental objects are both the metric and the connection. Now, this time, the connection um, has this important part, this formation tensor. And again, you live in a space time which is completely flat and, and torsion free. And non metricity is your fundamental geometric object. So in case you're not familiar, uh, the, here is the definition of the non-matricity tensor. This is the covariant derivative with respect to an independent connection gamma acting on the metric. So you have then this uh, non-matricity tensor here, Q alpha mini. Again, it has three indices. You cannot build the scalar quantity at linear order. You have to go to quadratic order in the non-matricity, but now, it is symmetric in the mu nu indices due to the metric. And you will have five independent contractions at the quadratic order in non-metricity. Again, with Lagrange multipliers, you have to make sure that you recover um, flat space time and torsion free space time. Among these five three parameters, you have to choose them in this very specific way in order to obtain a completely equivalent theory to general relativity. So in, if you want to compare it again with the standard formulation of uh, the Einstein-Hilbert action, you see that the quadratic uh, non-matricity scalar equals to the richest scalar of the Einstein-Hilbert action up to some total derivatives again. 
which but this time depends on the non-metricity tensor. Some contraction of the non-metricity tensor. So um, the fact that this um, space-time is completely flat and torsion-free has actually huge consequences. So you have uh, enhanced um, diffeomorphisms here in, in this coincident general relativity. And the connection actually can then be set to zero by, by means of a gauge choice. <clears throat> so you can everywhere, um, you can put gamma alpha mu nu equals to zero. This is not just a local statement, but um, this is a gauge choice. So in the coincident gauge, when you actually look at the quadratic Lagrangian of the non-matricity tensor with the coefficients such that you have GR, in the coincident gauge, you see that the Lagrangian actually reduces to the Christopher symbol squared part of the Einstein-Hilbert action without the, without the boundary term. Okay, so there is no need for the Gibbons Hawking or boundary term for a well defined variational principle um, due, to this, um, due to this lack of the boundary term compared to the standard Einstein Hilbert action. And there's also more direct contact with the particle description of general relativity. Actually, if you describe general relativity in terms of a massless spin two particle and you make it interact with itself and you sum all of its interactions, you see that the summation actually gives the coincident general relativity action in the coincident gauge. And so this improved action principle could make some differences in consideration in energetics, thermodynamics or, or quantum theory. Okay, and sometimes if you just work in the coincident gauge for some calculation purposes, um, uh, it might be also uh, easy thing to do in this formulation. Okay, so this was the, the gravity sector basically. Now, what happens if you have coupling to the matter field and you might be aware of the fact that the same construction of general relativity relies very strongly on the minimal coupling principle. Okay, this goes hand in hand. So what happens if you try to um, apply this minimal coupling principle also to these other formulations? Imagine you, um, you have some gauge fields, some vector fields, um, and in standard general relativity, the way how you promote it to curve space time is you replace your Minkowski metric by some um, dynamical metric and your, your partial derivative by some covariant derivative. And minimal coupling means that this matter fields only couple to the metric or the, um, the square root of minus g. What happens if you, for instance, try to apply the same principle to the other formulation like teleparallel equivalent of GR. There, you immediately observe that um, actually you have non-minimal coupling to torsion, even for, for gauge fields, um, unless you do something at all by hand. So gauge fields already uh, in the covariant derivatives um, want to couple to the torsion sector. So the minimal coupling doesn't work. How about coincident GR? If you try to apply the minimal coupling principle there, then um, the same thing uh, works as in standard general relativity. So the gauge fields, they don't see the, the non-metricity sector. This is just mentioning gauge fields and actually um, concerning fermions the situation uh, in the teleparallel equivalent is even worse. So fermions really want to couple to torsion. And again, you need to find uh, by hand uh, ad hoc ways of um, making them not to couple to the same covariant derivative as in the remaining uh, Lagrangians that you use uh, for, for gravity and for our, our other matter fields. 
But in um, coincident general relativity, um, fermions also, if you have Dirac fermions, standard Dirac Lagrangian, then they don't see the uh, non-metricity part. So matter fields then behave exactly the same way as in standard general relativity. Okay, so this was now um, general relativity and matter couplings. Um, I would like now take this um, geometrical trinity in which we formulated the same theory of general relativity and show some examples that people have considered in the literature um, how you can try to extend or go beyond general relativity. Of course, you can take now your um, uh, this scalar quantities that were describing your general relativity action and you can promote them to some general functions. So you can take R and convert it into an F of R theory, same thing you could do with the, um, with the Q Lagrangian and you promote it to the F of Q theories. And similarly, um, you can have F of T theories. So even though the formulation where they were, you know, the three equivalent uh, formulation of general relativity. Once you promote them to general function, the equivalence completely breaks and you have very different modified gravity theories with different number of propagating degrees of freedom. So let me just mention uh, this, um, let's say this new way of uh, modifying gravity via f of q. Um, that might be interesting for some cosmological or, or astrophysical applications, um, especially if you try to, um, as Shinzi was mentioning, sometimes people are considering to use modified gravity to describe dark energy or dark matter. So imagine I'm just giving a, um, some ansatz uh, for the function. Imagine you have such an ansatz um, for this general function of your non-metricity, the quadratic non-metricity scalar, then you can immediately see um, this gives rise to a modified version of the Friedman equation. Uh, you have this nonlinear parts in the in the Hubble uh, function, and on the right hand side you have the standard matter fields. So now, of course, depending on this alpha parameter. Um, you can have um, either this modification becoming relevant in the early universe where um, you have the Hubble um, function squared bigger than this, this mass scale here in your, in your modification. And that could be relevant for, for the inflationary period. Or you, you can choose alpha smaller than one uh, if you are interested in the modification in the late universe. Um, especially if you are interested in, in applications to, to dark energy. All right, you could also um, wonder or um, think about considering um, other quadratic actions where you try to combine both the non-metricity terms and the torsion terms, maybe even their, their mixing among each other and you then ask yourself the question, how can I choose these parameters A's, B's and C's in a way that you don't have general relativity, but a theory that goes beyond general relativity with additional degrees of freedom. Again, uh, on completely flat space time. So usually, yeah, you can do that, but these theories um, seem to um, usually, yeah, suffer from strong coupling problem. So as soon as you move away from general relativity, actually, this is also true for, uh, for some of the backgrounds in F of T or F of Q type of theories. So <laughs> as Shinji was saying, uh, you know, you learn more about general relativity or you are appreciating general relativity even more um, by witnessing that um, 
things things actually do not work so well once you move away from general relativity. Okay, um, can you also extend, um, basically try to go beyond general relativity, but without adding degrees of freedom? This goes a little bit along the lines what Shinji has uh, shown, but he was breaking uh, time diffeomorphisms here. I want to keep all the four dimensional diffeomorphisms. So if you want to extend general relativity, but keep just two degrees of freedom, then you have to extend your geometry to a general affine geometry and not just uh, the pseudo Riemannian geometry. So imagine if you have a, such a Lagrangian with a general function that depends on the inverse metric and the symmetric uh, Ricci, Ricci tensor that depends on an arbitrary uh, connection. So this connection is not the Christoffel symbol. Um, in this way, you can achieve uh, that you only have two propagating degrees of freedom. Your connection gamma is um, not a dynamical degree of freedom. Um, this has effects for high curvature. So whenever this term becomes relevant, so this might be relevant for early universe cosmology. Um, the coupling to matter fields changes um, in this formulation, as I said, because this gamma is not dynamical, you could integrate it out. And this is gonna give rise to um, a change in the coupling to the matter fields. So um, you might have heard born infeld inspired type of theories, especially if you are somehow coming from string theory, these are very specific theories that you can construct from uh, stringy compactifications. And that would be a very, spe a very specific um, uh, function uh, of this more general uh, Lagrangian. All right, I think uh, I will then stop here. And uh, if you have any further questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Lavinia. This was very interesting. And so we are well within the, the scheduled time. So if you have questions, please go on. You can raise your hand. Okay, I see there is one question from Zakaria. Thank you very much for the nice poem. Uh, I have a question uh, concerning the equivalence because I know, for example, for teleparallel, uh, there is some equivalence between uh, this series and Albansky. Is there the same equivalence between this series of non-metricity and Albansky, or there is no relation? So, which theories are you? Are you, um, asking, um, are you talking about about, about Hardansky? I said uh, there is equivalence between f of t, uh, teleparallel, and Hardansky, but I don't know if it's the case for the metricity or there is nothing. Yeah, there. yeah, um, yeah. Probably you can rewrite uh, the f of q theories in terms of um, some scalar tensor theories in which you have two scalar fields interacting in a very specific way. Um, but I'm not aware of any any work that uh, that has looked into that. Okay, okay, thank we you. know that it has at least two scalar degrees of freedom, so it's not just pure Horndansky, but it could be, um, yeah, like a scalar scalar tensor theories. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see another question from Lin Jing. Um, hi, Lavinia. Um, hi. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, so you should ask the three equivalence, um, you know, um, expression, uh, formulation for the gravity, the equivalent. And uh, um, do you think uh, it's just uh, a random choice that we started with the Riemannian uh, geometry that Einstein uh, started out with uh, his uh, field equation in curved space-time, or is, is it preferred? What do you think? Well, 
Yeah, actually, I think at the beginning, he he even considered the coincident version. I mean, like the non-metricity version. He, he has some um, papers on it, but maybe because, you know, uh, he was learning from the mathematician um, geometry. Um, he was then quickly moved to the curvature because this was something that was studied more from mathematicians. So, um, yeah, he could have also just started, uh, you know, interpreting gravity in terms of non-matricity because this is a, yet another geometrical um, um, object, a, a property of space-time that you can that you could have chosen. So he has also some uh, initial papers, um, but he didn't push uh, any further. And at some point, he even started uh, being interested in torsion. He has this um, einstein katan um, type of things that he looked at. So only towards the later uh, end of his career, he, he started also to look, uh, to look at more general geometries. Okay. Um, um, so in your opinion, there are, you know, these three, uh, I mean, according to what you, uh, what you answered. So in your opinion, you think there are these three formulation are really kind of, you know, um, uh, equal. Yes, yes, they are completely equivalent. Yes, you cannot. At the level of the Lagrangian, as I said, they differ by this total derivatives, this boundary term. So there might be uh, differences if your manifold has a, some specific topology. But okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stefano? Stefano, you can. Yeah, I have, a, I have a quick uh, question. Um, thank you, Lavinia, for the uh, nice talk. Um, uh, in regarding the theory equivalent to GR based on non-metricity, you show that in the coincident gauge, basically you get an action which is purely quadratic in the connection. Is that basically the Schrodinger action? You know, the one that uh, he presented in the Structure of Space-Time book? Yes, yes, exactly. This is basically the... Um this Christopher squared part that uh, yeah, you know that it was uh, Hilbert who then added the boundary term in order to make it then fully covariant. That's yeah, why. because if Schrodinger basically added it, no? but it wasn't fully covariant. And then, so it's the same, and basically it's the Schrodinger action what you get. Yeah, exactly. Just um, in terms of fully, it's interesting, I never seen that written that way. <laughs> Just fully interpreted in terms of non-matricity, this comes actually naturally. In, you know, I guess you have yeah the covariant version of getting that without adding the um, this other boundary term that they were adding in order to get the curvature, um, the richest color. Yes, thank you. Okay, I don't see any further question. Um, I actually have a curiosity if I if I can ask. Sure. So, yeah. Because uh, for each of these three formulations, you you set up two out of three uh, to of the, the, these quantities to zero. So like the curvature, the torsion, or the nonmetricity. But uh, are there? I'm asking for ignorance. Are there studies of what happens if you allow? more than one of being non-zero and can you put constraints on this? Has this been done in the past? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the general quadratic Lagrangian with more parameters like ABCs that I have shown where you could have both non-metricity and torsion at the same time. You can actually show that um, you obtain, you know, and again, an equivalent theory of general relativity and depending on the specific gauge choice, um, you end up either in the teleparallel equivalent of GR or on the on the coincident general relativity. You could, yeah, you could in, in principle combine them together in a in a more general one. Okay. Okay. So, if there aren't any other questions, I would like to thank Lavinia again and so Shinji for the, uh, his previous talk. So we are. Thank you. Well, in, inside the, the schedule, so we can reconvene at 4.40 with the discussion session. So we have a slightly longer break than expected. So see you later.
Okay, so it's 4.40. I think we can slowly restart after the coffee break. So I see Diego is connected. So Diego will be hosting this discussion session, just a super brief introduction. Diego is currently a senior lecturer at the King's College in London. And he's also known for uh, his works in alternative theories uh, of gravity and cosmology. So I think if we all agree uh, of starting now, I can give you the word and you can start with the discussion session. Okay, thanks a lot, Nicola. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks a lot uh, and thanks for yeah suggesting that I lead the discussion without giving any instructions. So <laughs> as the, I, I did a bit more work than Thomas though. So I prepared one slide, uh, but uh, I think he, uh, well, it's also import, interesting that uh, we, we spend this time, maybe the first minutes, if there were any questions in the previous talks that people wanted to to ask now, I think that was 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 Thomas did was what Thomas did. So, if you have any questions for the previous talks or for the other speakers of the week, I think that's a good opportunity now to go back to them. So, please. Yeah. I don't know if someone sees who is reacting. Do you see them, Nicola? I check usually if people raise their hands. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't see anyone for now. Okay, so then it's gonna be a bit more, more challenging. So let me just uh, share this very simple slide. Uh, it's gonna be a bit provocative too. It's from some years ago. Uh, what's going on? I cannot play. Okay. Can, can you see my screen? I, I think so. Yes. All right, so at least in, in the talks this morning, well, my, my, this session is supposed to be on modified gravities and cosmology. And uh, this morning there were, well, this morning, not uh, earlier, there were a couple of uh, very nice talks on uh, extending gravity in a theory direction. Okay, here is the theory direction. We start from a uh, general relativity. Uh, there is this uh, old uh, new world of possibilities and there is also the phenomenological direction where you can you know, ask different questions, right? And I, I want to maybe, uh, since cosmology is one of them, eh, what, what, what can you buy when you explore the theory direction in the phenomenological direction? I think that uh, uh, it's important that we, we phrase this question on, on new theories of gravity, also in the language of what are we winning for cosmology or if it really makes sense to spend all this time and and resources on, you know, on any kind of direction or some of them are preferred because not only they are more beautiful from the point of view of theory, but also because, you know, you can use them to, uh, you know, to, to find solutions for challenges that GR faces. Okay, so, I, sorry. Oops, no. So, I would like to ask uh, maybe myself the previous uh, uh, speakers or pe people who have been speaking in the conference about uh, modifying gravity, where, where does their, their theory uh, fit in another classification? So for instance, in both uh, Lavinia and Shinji, they propose classifications for extensions of gravity, okay, which are based on the theoretical uh, direction, but I think it's important that they also phrase them in other directions, which have to do with the, well, the first point is clear. I think both of them are satisfied in both Lavinia's uh, triangle and Shinji's um, square, that you learn something more fundamental about gravity by extending in these directions. So you extend them either by, I don't know, forgetting about metricity or by adding any uh, you know, new operators with certain um, uh, invariances. So I think in both cases, this first question is satisfied, but then uh, I think it's also important that they, uh, you know, you, you extend your, your diagram in, in the following directions. First, do you improve anything as compared to GR fundamentally? 
So can you answer something about quantum gravity? Can you answer something about black holes? Right, those are the questions that I think should always be in our mind where whenever we go in, in this theory direction, which is wilder in a sense. Similarly, uh, what are the more for this particular session? Are there any new ideas about hierarchies that you buy that when you buy these uh, approaches? So is, is there any new mechanism that can help you to, to explain cosmic acceleration or even the hierarchy problem? For instance, when you break some symmetry, maybe there are new mechanisms that uh, allow you to, to extend uh, you know, other problems in physics to, to new ideas or dark energy. Uh, early universe, so you are going to modify gravity. And, uh, well, I didn't see any connection to early universe, but certainly it's, it's very important to test these ideas and also to see if you can uh, say something about the baryon uh, asymmetry or you know some of the questions of, of you know even if inflation do you need inflation in your theories can you can you leave ca can you make uh, other mechanisms uh, work that are not inflation so these kind of questions are important and finally do you have a testable phenomenology at late times like uh, cmb large scale structure there's going to be a talk later on more on large scale structure right also astrophysics but more also very important nowadays is there any laboratory test so we all know that it's very hard to test quantum gravity in the regular um well when you when you want to do it uh, from gr but these new ideas with new degrees of freedom are also uh, a nice uh, niche for what to test in a laboratory that can test very precisely gravity okay so I don't know, I would like to open now the, 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 the session to the, maybe to uh, Shinji and Lavinia, if they can comment a bit what they think about these points and then maybe we can go and continue with other people. So maybe Shinji, are you around? I don't know if, if he's around or not. I think he's gone home. Um, oh no, he, me. <laughs> yeah. he was too late. I think it's late in Japan. Yes, I see, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. One thing that uh, I think, uh, yeah, in fact, I should have asked this question to, to Shinji is the, I mean, the, the theories that we consider are effective theories. And uh, I mean, are there any, one thing that we sometimes do, sometimes we don't, is to check whether those, there are symmetries protecting, uh, I mean, the coefficients, for instance. Uh, when we, I mean, when, when Shinji, I mean, yeah, I guess this is a question I should have asked Shinji. So how, how stable are uh, I mean, the, the number of degrees of freedom of the theory against radiative corrections, for instance? Yeah. In general, this is, I think, something we should, should keep in mind. Uh, I mean, all the theories we consider are, are low energy theories and there should be symmetries protecting them. Otherwise it makes little sense to to, to, to explore them for specific values of the couplings. I guess this falls under the, well, I don't know, in the theory direction in this plot. Yeah, but well, I'm not following these new developments by Shinji, but I would assume that precisely, you, we have learned a lot about this kind of problems and I would assume that people like Shinji or other, <laughs> they should keep them in mind. So I don't know if someone else from yeah, this yeah. collaboration yeah, I should, I should have asked this question. I thought he would be around for the discussion. All right. Does anyone know the answer to this question? As I said, I don't. I didn't follow. I I just follow his talk, but didn't follow his work in detail. So. Yeah, maybe the other question I had uh, for for Lavin and Odi and ask it uh, again is uh, regarding exactly phenomenology. What what. Uh, I mean, in the in the in the class of theories that she considered, the, which are the most interesting, I mean, observables that one one would that she she thinks we should compute to, to test to test these theories. So that that's not entirely obvious to me. Yes, I mean, yeah, yeah. I guess for me, <laughs> after after having had some experiences in different type of modified gravity theories. Um, me personally, I am not very much convinced that, um, you know, that 
you know, that compared to GR, that they are really competitive theories, at least among these points that Diego is raising, um, either it doesn't work on the phenomenology side, or it's not really more technically natural than the cosmological constant, or you can't even construct uh, stable black hole solutions, or, I mean, um, yeah, both on the theory as well as phenomenology side, they all, yeah, mostly run into problems. Um, the the type of models that I just showed in this talk were, you know, this um, based on additional geometrical structures. If you have a f of t or f of q type of theories or more general quadratic actions, um, you know, already if you look for Minkowski or the sitter type of backgrounds and you look at um, perturbations on top of them, you see that they suffer from strong coupling uh, problems. And, uh, or, you know, when we were working on massive gravity, similarly, it was very exciting. And, uh, and also there was the, the, the motivation to try to tackle the cosmological constant problem, right? Um, so it has a more additional motivation, the theoretical motivation. And also, if you look at the... Um, Experimental also. <laughs> yeah. If you look at the stability and the quantum corrections, it was also nice to see that, you know, you have all these tunings, um, whether or not they can get large quantum corrections. We have, we have seen that is not the case and the, the, the graviton mass can be really tuned to a small value, but it doesn't get uh, large detunings. But then if you really force your background to be homogeneous and isotropic, then you know the, the, the tools that we are using to, to study them doesn't seem to be, to be working for the majority of the theories that goes beyond GR. So, um, when you say the tools that we have do not seem to work, I didn't quite understand what you meant in this last... You know, like we say, we have our homogeneous and isotropic background and we do perturbation theory on top of that. And, and we insist to have such, uh, such background solutions. But it could be that, you know, um, um, for some specific theories, we might need to start... Uh, with some small deviations from this perfect symmetry mm -hmm. um, in order to physically describe them. So Shinji was mentioning that, you know, you could, uh, you could have tried to have small anisotropic uh, solutions or small, uh, you know, homogeneities um, in order to construct some specific cosmological solutions in massive gravity. I see, I see what you mean. But this, in a sense, raises the question that Thomas raised the other day. I mean, we, uh, what, what, what is really the motivation for, for going beyond GR besides trying to understand, uh, to understand GR better? Because we seem to be running in loops and, uh, and it seems that GR is actually the, seems to be the best year, even from a, from a quote unquote theoretical point or phenomenological point of view. So um... definitely, I, I, I could, I, I, I would sign that <laughs> very big. Well, uh, <laughs> I well, mean, that... yeah, you know, I mean, we, of course, there are like, there were a lot of, or there are still motivations, like you mentioned, you know, can we, um, I think Shinji also mentioned, uh, can we maybe try to um, explain some quantum effects by actually modifying gravity? and still remaining classical. And, uh, and also, you know, when we look at uh, cosmological or uh, black hole singularities, there also people try to motivate that maybe you have to modify gravity in order to replace the singularity, um, for instance, for cosmology by a bounce, or, or you might try to find some non-singular black hole solutions. But, but even that is that, I mean, do we have a, I mean, I would be, be very interested in knowing a theory which, for which we can resolve the singularities classically, which has, and which has no other pathologies for which everything else works. Is there 
su such a theory, one single theory which resolves singularities classically and then for which everything else works, which is perturbative on cosmological scales, on local scales, which passes uh, all existing bounds. I mean, it's not even clear to me. I don't know, maybe you guys have a... Well, I mean, f yeah, for instance, Robert Brandenberger, he has worked a lot on, on different type of construction, like in terms of also cosmic strings or maybe um, some brains that you could motivate coming from string theory and their, their, their presence um, um, would change the, the behavior inside the, inside the black holes. Um, but if you probably push it further and look really, study in detail the perturbations everywhere, you know, in the entire evolution, <laughs> which I doubt that it has been really done in detail. I, I, I'm not sure if, uh, if there is such an existing, existing solution. And, you know, apart from this uh, black hole or cosmological singularities, then, you know, people now also get got a little bit more interested due to this H0 and sigma H tensions. I don't know how serious you are really taking. I mean, Adam Rees gave, uh, gave a talk last week here. Uh, he's super convinced <laughs> that this is something new beyond the Lambda CDM. Um, if it's the case, it could be exciting, but I think I agree with you that maybe uh, we should actually be motivated by some fundamental symmetries or, or something that could really guide us in terms, instead of, you know, like just trying so many different uh, possibilities. Yeah, I mean, in, in Bayesian terms, if I have to choose between GR and the, and the different theory, I'm going to choose the, the simpler of the two, right? And uh, so I, I think unless uh, unless you have one should, something should you win. Problem. Uh, say it again. Diego? Unless you win something with the other proposal, that's my my exactly. point with this. Yes, yeah. unless you win something, unless yeah, there is this Occam razor factor. So the simpler, I, I mean, for, for the same phenomenology, I prefer the simpler theory. Then, if we if a modified gravity theory solves a problem, could be dark sector problem, could be the H not tension, even though I'm not convinced that it's not due to just systematics, or it could be, yeah, the interior of black holes, singularities. So then, then it would be really interesting. It just isn't clear to me that we have such one theory at hand because it takes a lot of time to, to explore then the phenomenology. So we would like to, to yeah, to, to zoom in on, on a, at least a class of theories to, to we try to do phenomenology, especially for smaller scales, because here, I mean, when it comes to cosmology, things are relatively easier, if, but if we want to test the theory on smaller scales, um, that becomes more challenging. And I'm thinking here about gravitational wave uh, observations. So I think we have a talk next uh, about this, perhaps tomorrow as well. But I, yeah, I guess, like to go along your line, what you said, you know, GR exists already for more than 100 years and it has been tested in so many different ways. And some of the theories, maybe they exist uh, since 10 years or whatsoever. And then people just have looked at a specific cosmological background plus some linear perturbation. And then maybe even some comparison to the uh, Planck data or whatever, but um, not really pushed it uh, uh, in the scrutiny in the same way as we do we do with GR, GR, right? And mostly actually already at early stages, most of these theories, they don't survive. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that's Raising probably up. also the reason why we haven't really, you know, studied something in such a great detail as GR because yeah, they, they don't pass the first First that's test. why I was trying to reverse the argument. So from, from the phenomenological point of view, what do you think would be the, the best? I mean, if you, if you had a billion euros and you could invest it in an experiment and that could help, because it's clear that GR, maybe just modifications from GR, they appear at the Planck scale and then there's no accelerator, no experiment we can construct. But 
under the optimistic assumption, deviations appear at lower energies. I mean, where do you think we should put our money? I mean, from, from really from um, an experimental point of view, I'm not an experimentalist myself, but I'm, I'm well, in, as a phenomenologist. Well, there, was, there has been this discussion in the past, and of course, uh, dark energy was sold. Uh, I mean, things like nuclear or LSST are going to cost the millions of millions. Uh, one of their main motivations was to try to find deviations from dark energy, I mean, from cosmological constant. But, but will you, by looking at linear perturbations or perhaps mildly non-linear perturbations, will you really be able to, to discriminate no. modified gravity from some, from some exotic matter or exotic dark energy? Yeah, I don't know. No, no, I mean, yeah. sorry. Yeah. I was just gonna, can I chime in? Yes, please. I, I'm gonna open. Yeah, sorry. We have 20 more minutes, so let's uh, everyone speak now. Not at the same time, though. So, Matthew. <laughs> Great. So, yeah, just on that point, I I agree with a lot of what you guys are saying. I think it's really tough to. Yeah, it, it's hard to give up GR, and I think uh, a lot of years of work, a lot of people have realized that. Um, more on the Fino side, I guess, is is where I've done some work and. Kind of what you said, like in the sense that low energy is where we can test on large cosmological scales a little bit easier uh, because you know we we don't run into whether whether or not this is yeah what the what the ultimate like ultraviolet part of the theory is, which is certainly interesting. Um, I do think that there there's uh, there's a hope with this kind of large scale structure measurements to see some kind of deviations. Now, large scale structure measurements can be hard. And like you said, we can look in the linear regime. I, I'll talk a little bit later about looking into kind of the mildly nonlinear regime. Um, but yeah, the, the hope here is that, well, one, these large scale structure measurements would tell us a lot about just Lambda CDM, you know, so th these are good measurements to do galaxy clustering and stuff. Um, but we will have pretty precise data. And so I think having alternatives to the standard Lambda CDM paradigm, at least just in a sort of data analysis way to, 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 to constrain even just Lambda CDM, that will actually, I, I think we'll, we could, you know, explore more of the uh, parameter space of say dark, you know, just basic EFT of dark energy stuff. So. Now, I mean, whether or not we'll find anything different, I, I, I don't know, but I think the chances will be, um, yeah, it, it's a non-zero chance, <laughs> but um, yeah, in terms of what I would bet on, I don't know, but it does at least provide a direction, um, things to look at, different observables to look at in large scale structure so that, you know, maybe we see something, maybe we don't, um, but yeah, I agree it might be tough. Well, now we know that you have 1 million euros because otherwise you wouldn't be betting. So. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. I think, yeah, those experiments, uh, yeah, these are it's billions of dollars um, for these um, uh, telescopes. And, you know, even, even if there's no, I think a lot of them were, yeah, there was a lot of hope to see some deviations. But e even if we don't, I think we, we still learn a lot about uh, the universe. Um, there's a few fronts. Obviously, we look for, say, non Gaussianities coming from inflation is one big thing. Other um, things about neutrino masses, et cetera. So there, there at least is, uh, you know, many possibilities in, in these measurements that don't necessarily have to deal with um, changing GR. But while we're looking for those, um, we can, uh, we can also look for more gravitational effects. Nice. So, thank you. Any um, anyone else have uh, more comments on these ideas? So, no one is mentioning dark matter. Uh, I mean, that was one of the motivations to modify Newtonian dynamics, right? Uh, uh, well, we we know that the dark matter problem is very challenging if you want to do it with a different. Uh, mechanism, right? Because you have a multi-scale uh, 
observable. Like, uh, but also, is there any one in the he, well among the participants who want to comment on dark matter, or maybe whether modified gravity may? Yeah, I know that Shinji has worked on this too, so it's a pity that he's not around. Uh, do you have any comments on this, guys? Well, isn't it much harder to explain dark matter with modified gravity? I mean, it is. It is for the I, I, really I, of, a, of a very light scalar field, which then is. I mean, it's. I mean, I don't know if we should call it modified gra modified gravity or modified matter or fast dark matter. I mean, it, yeah. There are ways in which we can test those scenarios, as, as you know, we, we talked about that the other day, pulsars and super radians, that uh, when it comes to other models of modified gravity that explain dark matter, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe Shinji has his own, his own model, so it's, yeah, it's a pity he's not there, but I don't think they've been explored to this. I mean, I, I mean there are I things think... like, but you can you can try to have modified gravity to have modified Newtonian uh, gravity, yeah. like MOND type of theories. They have been tried to be embedded into some more you know covariant theories. Yeah, but but there are strong bounds on on, on that, right? Because you need, I mean, you need vector fields for that. I mean, it can be done. I mean, if you want to modify. I don't think it can be done with just a scalar field. So, the, but well, you're more of an expert of vector fields, I guess. But for instance, there are very strong bounds on Tevis from, from all sorts of observables. And yes, yes. I mean, like even within this f of q theories that I had mentioned, we have looked at. Um, um, yeah, surprisingly, it, it it can recover more type of phenomenology on galactic scales. But you know to I think Matthew also mentioned that like if, if you have to like then you know compare it with different data and now for this month you would need to take this specific theory embed it into Boltzmann code make sure that that the CMB scale everything works fine and then you look at your structure formation and embed it into an embedded simulation and I mean this is really very tough things to do and for which model do you do it takes a lot of time. So uh, you basically sometimes just indicate there is there is some potential, but uh, it's really hard to investigate them in, in more in, in more detail. Also for the gravitational waves now, I mean, well, what type of waveforms shall we look at coming from which type of theories and yeah. yeah, I on on that uh, on that note, I this is why I think a lot of the EFT approaches are are powerful because say we observe some deviation in large scale structure from lambda CDM. Now, I mean the EFT, it's not really going to tell you exactly what it's from, right? Like it could be modified gravity, it could be some kind of <clears throat> dark matter, some some kind of strange dark matter substance that we have. And so from the EFT point of view, you may not learn exactly what it is, but you'll learn that there's something there and then can focus in. Um, and it just gives you some general parameterization for things to, to look at without having to, to know all the details, which I, at least uh, in terms of looking at the experiments can be, can be kind of powerful. Yeah, some of that you can also do on, on the video was asking about gravitational waves. The, such an EFT approach can also be attempted on, on smaller scales for, for, for black holes, for perturbations of black holes, uh, for binaries. So there is some work in, in, in that direction, but just the, the sheer number of terms that you can write in the action prevents a, a simple, I mean, uh, prevents doing too many of these calculations because it's much harder than, than doing just uh, linear perturbations on some FRW um, background because you have to face technical problems about the well positiveness of the initial value problem and so on and so forth. So, but, but there is some work in that direction especially for the, the for black hole perturbation theory, which is closer in nature to the, to, to the, the cosmological problem. So, uh, so 
which is why I think one of the, at least this is my personal opinion, one of the, the most interesting and cleanest observables that we have on local scales is the ring down of, um, of black holes, because that's where linear theory um, applies. The inspire and the ring down, I don't believe really the merger is the, the place to, to look at because that's much more difficult to produce, uh, to, to have predictions in that, in that non-linear regime. The same problem that we have in cosmology. When you go to the non-linear regime, it's much harder to make predictions. Or you can make them in a limited number of, uh, of theories. But the problem is there is still this huge degeneracies that remain at the linear, linear order. I mean, unless they don't suffer from some theoretical pathologies like ghost or gradient instabilities, because they have so many additional operators, parameters, they can explain the linear physics with no problem, you know? And then you still have, yeah, huge degeneracies. You have to break them and you have to do this. Uh, I don't know, sure, because uh, I, I, I imagine if a theory has a, uh, uh, more degrees of freedom than just two. So maybe with the exception of the theories that Shinji looked at, I imagine compact objects or black holes would be coupled to this field. Uh, so you would have a charge and maybe the charge is very small, but then it will produce a small deviations. And uh, now perhaps not with LIGO and Virgo, but in the future we'll be able to make, to put, I mean, very strict bounds on, on deviations from, from GR in the, in the linear, in both linear regimes with which we deal with gravitational waves, both the early spiral and the, and the ring down. So I'm not completely pessimistic regarding that, uh, but I agree that, I mean, we would be measuring one number, a charge, and we would have a whole parameterization of theories with lots and lots of, uh, of free parameters that, that, that I agree on, but at least- yeah, There will be some small deviation uh some you know charge it could be a scalar it could be a scalar part of a vector it could be an additional tensor it could be an additional a fine geometry it could be horava lipschitz it could be symmetry you know i mean <laughs> yeah you could have so many still possibilities that would explain the same uh, in physics uh, yeah no, that, that is true <laughs> although we also have experiments at different scales so maybe that will help because i, I imagine the, the, any yeah, combining them all together. Or you can, you can combine different scales or compare them. I mean, we also have lots and lots of sources. So you can probably stack the sources on top of one another and learn something from that. Yeah, I was just gonna mention that our, um, I've seen a bunch of talks in the last few years from our particle physics friends, you know, basically just saying that you know, the next step in the standard model is, is essentially just doing standard model effective field theory, which is adding, you know, 50, 100 new higher dimensional operators and just trying to do calculations to see what kind of small deviations you can, you can maybe measure at some future accelerators or current ones, you know, without, without huge motivation for, you know, where they might come from, but just that if we believe the standard model is an effective field theory, then you can have a hundred different operators at dimension six, eight, you know, whatever. And yeah, it, there's a lot of parameters, but kind of, if you have nothing, you have no other motivation, that's the way to go, I, I, I think. And then the question becomes, how do you make those computations, you know, the most efficient? Um, you know, and for black holes, you know, I, there's interesting stuff where with amplitudes um, uh, techniques, where they're trying to make these calculations very efficient to produce the waveforms. And so, you know, if that gets extended in some kind of effective um, theories, uh, you know, to look for different waveforms, that could also be interesting. So the problem might shift a little bit from some strong theoretical motivation to really building up these calculational tools. Yeah, although even in an EFT, again, I think there sh should be, I'm not a theorist myself, but there should be, I mean, ways to discriminate, to, to exclude some portions of parameter space. We heard about positivity bounds. We, we talked about symmetries, uh, ghosts and uh, 
I mean, yeah, I'm not completely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and then you 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 do all those, and then you're left with still a bunch of parameters, and those you have to kind of test. And yeah, you, you can probably try to impose certain numbers of different symmetries, and yeah, the kind of positivity bounds are great because things that you thought could be there can't be there, and you know that cuts down your parameter space. Um, and so developments on on those fronts are also kind of theoretically helpful and interesting. So yeah, I think we have to we have to do all that. And also the parallel to to particle physics. Uh, I mean, it's one that's often uh, I mean referred to. But, but and uh, and the message is a bit dis discouraging because they've been trying to look for uh, uh, that community has been looking for deviations for from the standard model for 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 decades now and. And uh, and this is often regarded as uh, as well as a pessimistic message for 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 us in gravity. But we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't forget that in gravity we just started this this enterprise. So we just started to have data now. So it's not that we've been building uh, uh, huge accelerators for decades. I mean, we we just have like thirty plus or I forgot how many detections from LIGO and Virgo. So there is still hope. In the future, we have much uh, more accurate or precise detectors. So uh, I, I agree with, with, I mean, I'm also a bit discouraged. It seems we're going in that direction, but also we should keep in mind that we're just at the beginning of this enterprise. That's, that's, I, mean, see, I thought I would mention that since there was somebody, I think Mario, who drew the same parallel uh, on Friday, the same parallel. In, in the context of, of the particle physics analogy, I, I think it's interesting listening to the to the G minus two controversy that's raging at the moment, that it seems that the, the experimental side is, is kind of consistent. They have consistent experiments getting the same value. What is the problem is that the theoretical calculations of what those numbers should be in the standard model don't agree. And, and we, haven't, we haven't got to that stage yet in gravity, but we, we might be heading down a, a, a path where the theoretical calculations of what something should be in GR might actually end up uh, being where the challenges arise. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I'm thinking of eccentricity and eccentric waveforms, and uh, for Liz, it would be very challenging to to claim a deviation from GR if we don't keep those systematics under control. You're muted if you're speaking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, we witnessed a miracle, Enrico being optimistic. Well, this, <laughs> this doesn't happen often. So this session was certainly worth it. So I want to make a last uh, suggestion. But uh, before, if there is someone else who wants to comment on this, uh, please go ahead. Maybe just this last point about the theoretical consistency checks that you could do you know you mentioned like uh, positivity bounds you could there are also all the swamp land conditions or you could impose yep. that um that your quantum corrections should be stable and things like that and there also it depends to which community you are really talking because there are also assumptions about this uh, theoretical constraints that you are imposing so then People then, especially phenomenologists, then they say, okay, why do you assume, assume that you have a local Lorentz invariant UV complete theory? Uh, if I give up on that idea, then I couldn't care less about your, your conditions or, or, or the, all the swamp land conditions that mostly are related to some sort of string theory compactification. So if String theory is not really the UV complete theory. Why should I care about you know constraints motivated coming from there? So yeah, some people find those as an yeah. artificial um, yeah things that you put. But I think if you combine all of these things together, and Enrique also mentioned all this additional dynamical analysis, goals, whatever, and um, and then different type of measurements from CMB to gravitational waves. Um, yeah, I think you could then, based on your assumptions, rule these theories out. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, I want to take it from there and also uh, suggest that one of the ideas of going beyond general relativity, one of the beautiful things you can do is try to recover general relativity in a natural way. And uh, for instance, if there is a RG flow that takes you to GR, no? meaning that uh, you assume that this theory is the way it is, but then the running of the couplings take you to GR, you may learn a lot about fundamental, about things that you think are fundamental, but they are really there even more fundamentally because they emerge. So we didn't discuss emergence of GR. And I think that's at least in, in, in or Java gravity, uh, we have been trying to follow this program uh, and it's very beautiful. And I also, I'm gonna break with, stop with here that I think that by modifying GR, uh, a way to learn about it could be also, you can flow naturally to it through uh, yeah, to it through uh, quantum corrections or through some of the bounds that other people are doing. I think that so you take for instance anyway your favorite G, uh, modified gravity, uh, make the flows, put your bounds, and see how GR emerges in a corner. That's fantastic. Uh, and I have to cut here. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, I know many people are shy, but uh, I'm sure uh, it was very valuable for everyone. So who is now chairing the session? Because I'm, I'm, I'm still chairing the, cha the session. Okay, so, so Nicola. Thanks I, Diego I for sure. uh, taking care of this discussion session. I would say. You want my slide? <laughs> yeah, it, that was. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah, all, all, the, all the session was pretty interesting and inspiring, I would say. For... And we knew you would do a great job even, even without guidelines. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so I would say now we can move to the next speaker. I see Alex, you already have your camera on. You can start yeah, sharing your screen. Cool. So yes, we now have uh, Alex Nielsen, who is a, an associate professor at the Stavanger University. And his work uh, covers uh, many topics in astrophysics of black holes and gravitational waves. And today we'll speak about searching for black hole echoes in gravitational wave data. So I will give you a five minutes reminder by the end of the talk, you can go on. Okay, hi everybody. Um, can, you, can you see my screen? Is yes. it correctly sharing? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yep. okay. So hi everybody, uh, greetings from Norway. Uh, I'm gonna start up front with the, uh, the somewhat disappointing summary of my talk, which is that I, I don't think that we have detected uh, black hole echo signals. Um, I think most people probably agree with this, although it is uh, fair to say that not everybody agrees with this. Uh, so that is kind of the, the takeaway message of what I'm gonna, gonna tell you about today. Um, I don't need to uh, introduce these various different uh, pictures that I have on the next slide. Um, we, we do have now increasing observational evidence for, for objects behaving like black holes. As I say, I'm not going to talk uh, specifically about these uh, different, different uh, data sets. Um, just maybe a chance to say a comment in relation to what um, Thomas Soterio was asking about in the discussion on Friday. Uh, it, I feel, at least personally, that we're probably in a golden age of at least black hole physics at the moment. We have a, we have a lot of data coming in. Um, Thomas sounded that maybe he was a little bit pessimistic. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, maybe he's pessimistic about what will happen once we exit this uh, golden age that we're currently in. Um, by definition, what comes after a golden age is, is not as good as the golden age. Um, but that, that certainly isn't gonna happen until after LISA. So there's, there is plenty of time for uh, people to enjoy the, the current golden age that we're in, at least in, in black hole physics. Um, so we have all this evidence that there are objects behaving like black holes. Um, some people like to ask the question, are they really black holes, these objects that we see? Uh, of course, uh, to answer that uh, question really depends on your definition of what you mean by a black hole. Um, without wanting to get too much into the sort of technical details of what a, um, we should define as a black hole, that it's fair to say that um, black holes are typically defined by their horizons. So, so what you're really looking for, you're really asking, are these observations consistent 
with the existence of horizons. Uh, there are certainly models that, that um, the models out there that behave a lot like black holes, but don't have horizons. Um, will certainly be consistent with orbits of stars going around um, Sagittarius A star, for example, will also be consistent with accretion disks in certain situations um, and other kind of observations. And this brings in the idea of uh, these uh, echoes, exotic compact objects, ECO. Uh, the exotic compact objects is not quite the same thing as, as the echoes that I'm going to talk about, but the echoes are the, in some sense, the experimental signature of ECOs, um, depending on how you want to want to pronounce uh, ECOs. Um, Though those two things are, are, are a little bit different, but almost the same thing. Um, and uh, I don't know, actually, I don't know who came up with this picture that I have here on the right. Uh, but uh, this is taken from the from the web page of the group in, in Lisbon. Um, and, and basically what it's showing is that if you, if you see a, if you see a ring down signal, that this isn't necessarily a uh, definitive uh, indication that you have uh, a horizon and a black hole. Okay, so in, in terms of motivations for these uh, exotic compact objects, um, I, I feel it's, uh, it's uh, reasonable to say, important to say even that, that uh, this, this isn't really just parameterizing our ignorance of what is still not ruled out. Um, there are actually motivations for taking some of these exotic compact objects seriously, and they are, they are addressing some, some important questions that need to be answered anyway even in sort of standard um, physics scenarios. For example, taking seriously the, uh, the conformal anomaly that we, are know, we know occurs with um, quantum fields on uh, classical black hole spacetimes. If you, uh, if you want to take this conformal anomaly seriously and write down, for example, an effective theory for it that describes it, then you might well end up going down the path that leads certain people to objects like gravistars. Uh, also, if you are trying to address the information paradox or trying to understand what is happening with the uh, relationship between information and black holes and Hawking radiation, uh, this has certainly led some people down the path of um, suggesting that we should give up on this so-called no drama um, assumption that there's nothing special happening at the horizons of black holes. Uh, and give up that and, and leads people to, to these firewalls where there is something dramatic happening at the horizons of black holes. So there are motivations uh, coming from deeper questions for why one would consider models uh, of these exotic compact objects that are not black holes that don't quite have horizons or don't have horizons that uh, behave in the way that they would behave in uh, Einstein gravity. Uh, people have actually been doing observations on this sort of stuff uh, without gravitational waves for 20 odd years now. In particular, these uh, accretion dominated um, advection flows that are seen with uh, black hole and neutron star X-ray binaries with a donor companion that is donating. There is matter flowing from the donor into an accretion disk. It's falling onto the, to the compact object. Um, these X-ray observations, they go from various different states at different times. Usually they're in this uh, soft state, but sometimes they go into what is known as a hard state where the X-ray um, emission changes. And if you ask the question of uh, what is happening in that situation, you are probably uh, dominated, or well, these observations are well fit by models of, of the matter flowing very, very rapidly, sort of accreting directly onto the compact object. And if you compare the luminosities that you see, um, you get a plot like uh, the plot on the uh, on the right here, that shows that the behavior of these um, accretion-dominated vection flows is different for neutron stars, objects that have surfaces, and uh, and the black hole candidates, where the distinction here between the neutron stars, which are the white unfilled circles, and the uh, black holes or the black hole candidates, which are the black filled circles, uh, the distinction here is that probably the neutron stars, well, the neutron stars have a surface, there is matter flowing onto that surface, it's hitting that surface, that is giving a, um, a loud signal in X-rays, and with the black hole candidates, uh, it is not giving such a signal, so they are um, dimmer by up to two or three orders of magnitude in their luminosity. 
and the distinction here that the separation between neutron stars and, and black holes here is, is really uh, is given um, by their whether they're filled circles or unfilled circles is just given by their mass just their measured mass from the binary uh, system so that is, that is at least suggesting that the, the black hole candidates are behaving differently from objects that have hard surfaces where there's something for the the accreting matter to fall onto and, and then become very luminous in x-rays. And uh, part of the reason why this, this kind of test works so well is uh, this uh, formula down here on the left and the lower left, uh, which, is the, which is a formula describing the amount of time that it takes a light signal to propagate from a distance, our uh, distance away from the horizon of a black hole, uh, sorry, uh, our bounce, the distance from the, um, black hole to, to an observer at a distance r distance. Uh, this is a standard calculation that one can do in a Schwarzschild space time, for example, standard calculation for students, just uh, calculate the null, um, null trajectories and the Schwarzschild time elapsed for this um, process. And what you see is you, you get this uh, logarithmic term, which um, means that you are actually sensitive to uh, light that is being reflected off or hitting something very very close to the to the uh, what would be the the black hole horizon so if you actually put some numbers into this formula here um the t minus t zero this is basically the time it takes in the in the Schwarzschild space time relative to the time it would take in totally flat space time to travel some distance from our bounce to uh, our distance if you put in sort of typical numbers for gw15914 uh, at its distance, you would find that this, this time difference is of the order of milliseconds. So there is only milliseconds, it only takes milliseconds more for light to come from a small distance from the horizon, for example, the Planck distance, um, than it uh, would do in flat space. Obviously, if that distance is, if the bounce is at zero, if it's uh, trying to get light off of the uh, horizon, this, this goes to infinity, but it goes to infinity very, very slowly as you as you get closer and closer to the would-be horizon. So that is, that is the thing that, that is, is giving you access, observational access to processes that, that are occurring very, very close to um, the, uh, the black hole horizons. So that brings us to the basic idea of echoes. Um, and the basic idea of echoes is that if there is some surface very very close to the horizon of the black hole or somehow the, the the physics is changed very close to the black hole um such that the black hole the, the object is very very compact is is almost a black hole but not quite a black hole and there is some structure very close to where the horizon would be uh, there is formed uh, some kind of membrane or some sort of firewall where where potentially light or gravitational waves can reflect off um, because in standard gr there is this angular momentum barrier a little bit further out, um, signals that get inside this uh, region, they can actually bounce around in a sort of cavity. There is formed a, a sort of optical cavity between the whatever is your your new physics near to your horizon and the uh, the standard angular momentum barrier. Um, that cavity isn't completely uh, hermetically sealed. There is propagation of signals through through the boundaries, and so what you get is you get this series of echoes of uh, pulses from, from these signals that are bouncing around inside this cavity. And, and you see on the uh, right-hand side, something that looks like a, the kind of waveform that you might expect. You would expect the, the typical um, in-spiral merger ring down signal you would see from a binary coalescence, the type that, that LIGO sees. And then after some period of time, uh, uh, an echo from that. And then after some another period of time, some other echo and another period of time, another echo and so on. And as energy slowly leaks out of the uh, cavity, the, the amplitude of these echoes progressively gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And you can calculate how, uh, what, what kind of things those, uh, those echoes should look like in various different models. Um, typically, these things are called, the waveforms here are called uh, IMRES, I-M-R-E, which is for in-spiral merger ring down echo. Uh, this is not quite the same thing as IMRES or EMRES, um, depending on how fast you talk. IMRES are intermediate mass ratio in spirals. EMRES are extreme mass ratio in spirals. So the IMRES are not the IMRES or the EMRES. Uh, so, so 
in terms of wanting to produce analytical models for what these signals are, so now we, we, we have to transition slightly from the, the, uh, the deeper motivations for asking about exotic compact objects and uh, trying to understand sort of big problems. Now we actually do need to transition to, to actually writing down models that we can compare to data. So now we actually get into the regime of, to some extent, we are parameterizing our ignorance about what is going on and we are just trying to um, parameterize the possibilities of what could be going on. Um, but if you take uh, generically in the high, compact, high compactness limit, uh, you will find that the multiple structure um, rapidly approaches Kerr as you take whatever structure you want closer and closer to the horizon. You can then, for example, model things like a small perturbation on, on a Kerr background, on a given fixed Kerr background, get some kind of Tchaikovsky equation, impose a boundary reflectivity um, R of, of omega, where the re reflectivity of your surface somehow depends on frequency. Um, this would be zero for the horizon of a Kerr black hole in, uh, in general relativity, for the event horizon of a Kerr black hole in general relativity. But you can imagine parameterizing your, your, your ignorance about some surface or some structure existing very close to the horizon that has some non-trivial reflectivity, such that these echoes are set up in your cavity, such that you potentially can go out and observe them with gravitational wave observations. Uh, there have been a variety of groups who have, who have worked on putting together analytical templates based on this, this sort of recipe here that I describe. Um, those, those models are, as I say, typically based on this idea that there are small perturbations on curve background. Obviously, if you're introducing non-trivial new physics, ideally one would have a complete solution, a complete non-linear solution, with complete evolution where there is energy in the echoes and the energy is being drained potentially with some super radiance effects coming out. Um, we haven't quite got there in the uh, analytical modeling yet, but that is, that is certainly one of the challenges going forward. Right, so uh, this slide is uh, sort of just a list of some of the echo searches that have been performed over the years, starting in 2016. Um, uh, there are different types of searches that have been performed on different sets of data. So I've tried to list uh, some of the different sets of data that have been looked at, some of the different types of searches, search methodologies, unmodeled, modeled. And uh, in the last column on the right, I have tried to capture uh, in words as best I can the sort of main message that is coming from the, the uh, search in, in, in question. Uh, we go from the, the first search in 2016 that sort of gathered a lot of attention um, drew, everybody's, uh, drew everybody's notice to, to what was going on, where they, they claimed a tentative evidence for these echo signals. Um, various groups have tried to reproduce those results uh, with uh, various, in, uh, various levels of success. Um, I myself, with my group in Germany, did uh, try to, uh, to reproduce that. Um, we uh, weren't able to entirely rule out the signals that... Um, Betty and et al were claiming from 2016, uh, but we can kind of argue about exactly how significant those uh, that, that tentative evidence actually is. So this, this, this has gone on through the community for a while now. Um, there have been various different techniques suggested using various different models, um, various different uh, data sets. Um, Enrico, for example, has posted a um, stringent limits based on a, a sort of stochastic background from all of these back black holes out there in the universe emitting their, their little echo signals. Uh, we go all the way down. Uh, it's uh, not clear to me whether the, the, uh, the, uh, the heuristic level of evidence is decreasing as time goes by, um, but we do go from kind of tentative evidence and uh, tentative detections down to the bottom here where the LVC, for example, weighed in recently with uh, what they called no evidence, which sounds pretty strong. Um, uh, there, are, there are a few things recently. So this Bob Holden, for example, more evidence, 2019. Uh, one can ask, as uh, was asked by um, Abedi Ashori, Narutaka and, and Wang, who asked, are all these different results consistent with one another? Uh, that is, uh, is possible depending on how you interpret it, whether you're trying to interpret it as consistent with detections or consistent with non-detections. Um, so, so check out the, uh, the 2020 
a review article by Betty et al for a discussion of, of all these different um, models. And one thing that is attempted in, in that uh, uh, review article from 2020 is to, is to sort of take some of these uh, events and maybe look for possible subfamilies in the, uh, in the events. Um, that, that is maybe a little bit, uh, maybe premature, I would say, but I would encourage people to, to try that if, they, if they're uh, feeling optimistic. Um, as I said, we, uh, my group, we tried to, uh, to rule out the, uh, the Betty et al claims of, of tentative evidence. We weren't able to do that. Uh, what we were able to do was at least show that um, whatever was being claimed was very, very close to the noise threshold. So here on the left, uh, we did some simulations where we uh, injected known signals. So we injected echo signals into data and tried to recover them. Um, if the injected amplitudes are large enough, you recover them without any problem. They're very, very clear. And there's a nice kind of uh, straight line fit there where you recover the amplitude that you've injected all the way down to a certain level where it all just gets scattered and you're, you're dominated by noise. And that happens to be exactly the level that um, Betty et al were, were claiming for their tentative evidence of echo signals back in 2016. Uh, similar thing on, on the right for uh, injecting echoes with a, with a certain decay of amplitude. Um, if, you, if you inject loud, loud signals with loud amplitudes, you recover those no problem at all. There's a nice straight line fit for it, although there is quite a bit of scatter. Um, it goes up until uh, sort of more bluish values at the top there where, where there is kind of complete uh, uncertainty and uh, disorder in the rec recovered values um, because your amplitude is just too small to say anything meaningful about what you actually injected. And that, that is, that is, those are tests on known signals that have been injected, software injected into data and, and recovered. So, so we weren't able to rule out their, uh, their claims, but we were at least able to make the argument they are very, very close to the noise floor and uh, if you do want to rule them out, you either need a lot more data or you need significantly louder um, observations, significantly louder events. Okay, this is the, uh, the table that the, the LVC put out recently. Um, they, they basically went through uh, almost all of their uh, events in their, uh, in their catalog, in their second catalog. Um, the, the numbers here are provided so for each individual event. There is a, a Bayes factor here, which is, is a ratio of the likelihoods for, for a model that has uh, the, the Inspiro and Merger ring down echoes template, and, and relative to that, a, a template that only has the standard GR Inspiro Merger ring down. Uh, the way to read these numbers is basically uh, if you take 10 raised to the power that is indicated there, it gives you some idea of the, the, uh, the likelihood for the echoes model versus the no echoes model. So negative numbers are bad where it's preferring no echoes and positive numbers are good where it is actually preferring echoes. Uh, you see that the numbers are, are kind of a mix of positive and negative. Uh, none of them are very, very large in, in magnitude. So, uh, it is not necessarily possible to, to claim it. Well, it's certainly not possible to claim detections of echoes. It's also a little bit hard to, to rule them out and say this definitely is preferring no echoes. Uh, there is GW190521 down here, which is maybe the one that has the most, um, the strongest uh, indication that there are not echoes in that event. As I say, um, people have started beginning to wonder if we could maybe take out all of the positive values here, the ones that where it's preferring echoes to not echoes and, and figure out something that maybe means that they're more likely to give echoes or they give echo signals with louder amplitudes. As I say, I feel that is, that is a little bit um, premature. Uh, one thing that was uh, attempted was to argue that maybe there's something to do with the mass ratio. Uh, uh, you will see here on the, uh, on the list here that not all events have been included in the LVC run, uh, GW151012, for example, which was the event that was giving the most indication for echoes in the first run of, of LIGO that is not included in the LIGO results. And also the signal that they had recently where they had a uh, uh, something around a 26 solar mass black hole and a 2.6 mass something 
merging together, that is also not included here in the, uh, in the LBC results. Right, so uh, I wanna say a few things about challenges with the searches, also related to, uh, to the LVC results. Um, one of the uh, possible subpopulations that was claimed for these echo signals is maybe it has something to do with the mass ratio, and uh, maybe the higher the mass ratio is, uh, the, the louder the amplitude, the, the louder the echo signals will be. Uh, there was some tentative evidence for that maybe in, uh, in previous runs. As I say, LIGO did not actually include, uh, the LVC did not actually include GW1908-14 in, uh, in their run that they recently released. That is the one that has a mass ratio of about 10. Uh, so if there is a, uh, if, if larger mass ratios do give lar lar larger echo signals, you cannot see that from the LVC results. Um, I happen to know that Jahed Abedi has, uh, has actually run on GW1908-14. I hasn't published it yet, but uh, it does not give very high uh, evidence for echoes. In fact, it gives uh, uh, preference to non-echoes for GW1908-14. So, so that is maybe an indication that the, the mass ratio hypothesis is already going to fail because of GW1908-14. And uh, one would need to delve deeper into uh, fitting uh, subpopulations. Uh, I'm going to say about I'm going to say about model versus unmodel searches, uh, and then about prior ranges. So model versus unmodel searches. Some of the searches have been modeled. That means there's been a template. That means somebody has had to sit down and work out what the template should look at look like. Uh, the very first searches were were done using a very uh, very ad hoc, very uh, simple template. But template uh, technology has improved um, in the intervening years. Uh, and then there are unmodeled searches where, where people try to be more agnostic. The, the dividing line between what is a model search and what is an unmodeled search is probably not 100% uh, set in stone. So there are always some assumptions that need to be made, whatever you're doing, whatever kind of search you're doing. Um, but the, the main advantage of a model search is, is uh, its ability to discriminate noise events that you want to exclude. So I, I wrote down three, um, three different scenarios here that might uh, guide you in whether you want to do a model search or an unmodeled search. If you think there are echoes, but you don't know the model at all, you're completely agnostic, uh, then what you need is an unmodeled search. Uh, if you think there are echoes and you're, uh, you know roughly what the, set, the model is, then, then you probably should go for a model search. Uh, and if you don't think there are echoes and you want to rule something out, you want to rule a model out, then what you need is a model search. The reason is because typically, if you have a good understanding of what your model is, it will uh, discriminate against noise better than the unmodeled search, and you will get tighter constraints from the modeled search. So if you're trying to rule something out that someone else has claimed or something that you want ruled out, then a model search is going to do that for you better than an unmodeled search. Uh, it hasn't been studied in detail. Uh, exactly where the dividing line is between uh, when the model search is better than the unmodel search and how, how roughly you need to know the model in order for the model search to, uh, to be better than the unmodel search. But I can give you a sort of um, rule of thumb guide from uh, standard uh, GR binary black hole searches. Here, the, uh, the model searches tend to be about 50%, uh, have a 50% larger range in the, in the binary black hole systems, they can see relative to the unmodeled search that gives them a sort of between a three and a four, four times higher chance of finding signals than unmodeled searches. So you might expect a similar sort of thing um, for the echo searches, although obviously it depends on, on parameters and exactly what you're doing. Um, in terms of the, uh, the priors, uh, these numbers that are provided for whether the data prefers echo signals or not echo signals, this does actually depend critically on the prior ranges that you use within your theories, in particular, the prior ranges that are used within echoes theories. Now this, because it is new physics and it is pushing into unknown territory in terms of um, what parameters we should expect, there is a lot of uncertainty on what the parameter ranges should be. 
um, but that will affect whether the data ends up preferring the Eccles models or the non-Eccles models quite a bit. Um, one example that I, I have here on the slide is a comparison between um, something that I did with my group back in 2018 and uh, the, uh, the Lower Al group who uh, did a similar thing. The, the search method is, is quite similar. The waveforms, the, the model of Eccles is very similar. Um, the big difference is the prior ranges that are used. Uh, if you look at my, my column here of GW15914 type ranges, you see that my, my ranges for the parameters, and these are the same parameters in basically the same model, you see that the parameter ranges are much tighter in, uh, in what we were, we were doing than they were in the low at L. So the low at L is, is in some sense more agnostic to what exactly is the, the ECHOS model. Um, we were driven by a desire to, to see if we could find the signals that Babetti at L were claiming tentative evidence for, so we were able to put quite tight um, bounds on the on the prior ranges that we used for our search. Um, Lower et al were a little bit more agnostic. That does reflect itself ultimately in the in the base factors and the relative favoring of uh, echoes to non-echo models. Um, Alex, uh, you have five minutes left. Yes, thank you. Um, the the LVC now is uh, is adopting prior ranges that are very similar to what uh, the low at L are using. Uh, in particular, this amplitude prior range here uh, that that will have a a large impact on whether you um, have a, have a good chance of finding echoes or not. Obviously, if you allow that prior range to be too large, you are penalizing the echoes models for, uh, for not uh, being sort of distributed in that, in that prior range. And as time goes by, we are, we are maybe getting to the stage now where we have to accept that the, the amplitude range for, for loud echoes is already ruled out. There is, there is no way that there are loud echoes in the data. We would have seen them if there are. And, and those sort of prior ranges that are, are allowing a full range from zero to one um, are, are, are too wide now for uh, sensitive searches for uh, echoes going forward. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, priors on theories. This is where the fun uh, happens, um, particularly the prior on standard GR. So the, the base factors that are reported by the various different groups, for example, the, the LVC base factors that I talk about, they are giving the ratio of the likelihoods for the two models. Um, the probability of the data given the model. Um, in order to turn that into a probability of the model, uh, a posterior, one has to deal with the question of uh, what is your prior on the actual model? Uh, so in particular, what is your prior of general relativity, standard general relativity versus new physics of, uh, of echoes or non-trivial structure at horizons? Uh, this is a this is a fun thing to think about. It's a difficult thing to answer. Uh, it does actually have uh, implications because we can now make quantitative predictions for how our improvements in the bounds are, are going to improve as we go towards hundreds and thousands of, of LIGO Virgo Kagura events and LISA events going going forward with much higher SNRs. We can make quantitative predictions for how much better the, the bounds are going to get. Uh, in order to answer the question of whether that's going to convince anyone that there are echoes in the data, we need to have, uh, it requires this, this missing piece of how likely do you think echoes are versus standard GR as a theory. And we also don't know whether with these quantitative predictions of how much we're going to improve the bounds, whether we are able to explore most of the parameter space and we'll potentially be able to rule out maybe even all, most of the parameter space, or we're just scratching the surface of the parameter space. It is difficult to be quantitative about this. Um, it's something that I guess everybody has to sort of think about how, what, what kind of level of evidence would you need to see in order to start thinking that maybe there are echoes in the data? Because as we see at the moment, the, the base factors are, are kind of uh, not telling you either way, really. So uh, in conclusion, um, at least for me, there is no good evidence for echoes in the gravitational wave data to date. Uh, different models and different search techniques have been deployed by a number of different groups. That 
increases my confidence that probably there are no uh, uh, echoes in the data at the moment. Um, but it is important to point out that observational bounds are now non-trivial. If there had been loud echoes, we would have seen them. Um, approximately 5% of the total final mass is, is accreted in these typical LIGO um, binary black hole mergers. And something like more than 90% of this is disappearing. We can now constrain that more than 90% of this is disappearing below one Planck length from the horizon. So we actually have quite non-trivial constraints already. Um, and again, one can think that that is, that is going to improve at least to the 99% level as we go forward in the, in the coming years. So that is enough for me. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to you, Alex, for the very interesting talk. So it's time for questions now. Uh, does anybody have questions? I see Enrico. Yeah, I just have a sorry. Just have a question. One is sort of trivial. So why do you take uniform prior on the amplitude? Uh, I mean, so if you're since since you don't know what the amplitude, what the order of magnitude of the amplitude is, shouldn't be more. Yep. Yep. No. No. I. 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 I totally agree that it, that is a uh, that is a choice that needs to be made in the analysis. Um, if you take uh, a uniform prior, you are obviously treating equally all possible amplitudes. If you take a logarithmic prior, you are preferentially treating or increasing the prior range at very small um, amplitudes that will, for example, tend to favor the uh, the echoes hypothesis. Mm -hmm. But it it is certainly a a question that. That has to be answered in, in the analysis. It will favor, it will favor. Yeah. Uh, ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If 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 you allow low low amplitudes to be to dominate in your prior, when you compute the evidence, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and the other question I had was, um, so is it obvious to you what was different between your analysis and the original analysis by Nyayesh and uh, Abedi? So you say it was probably some. I guess some non-stationarity in the noise that they 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 saw, or was it something? Uh, like no, I think I think that the differences the differences actually weren't that large, first of all, and and most of those differences were down to uh, technical differences in the way that they estimated their background. I so see. they had they had actually been very conservative in the well, very um, what's it called? Uh, very efficient in the way they attempted to estimate their background in that they only tested it in something like 32 seconds of data, mm -hmm. uh, possibly because they didn't realize there's more than 32 seconds of data available. And uh, this meant that they had actually interspersed their echo signals on top of each other in that same 32 seconds in order to get their p-value. And we, we, were, we, we just expanded that and spread it out more. And it, 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 it lowered the significance by a factor of two, but, but not in it, not not a huge amount. I see. Okay. And it, it is borderline, I, I would say. I mean, it, it was, our results were not clear demonstrations that there were not echoes in the data. Thank you. Okay. I see there is a question for Sebastian from Sebastian. Yeah, you can go. Yes. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. First, let me thank you for this very nice overview, this, like short history of, of echoes here. Um, my question is, so these tests so far have been focusing on, on black holes, but in the beginning you also showed some other tests independent of this way before using electromagnetic signals. Um, are you aware of any works that aim to repeat this also for binary neutron star mergers eventually in the future, where we have in principle access to both type of uh, events, uh, uh, yeah, messengers? So, so, so you mean electromagnetic observations of binary neutron star mergers? Combining basically the, I mean, combining what we know from gravitational waves. Yes, echoes, I, I echoes, and on top of that, what we would see from electromagnetic signals from these neutron star mergers. Yes, I, I don't know what the uh, the observational challenges would be to observing potential echo signals from uh, mergers of, of uh, neutron stars. That I mean, there is an awful lot of uh, debris and matter flowing around in the mergers that will complicate exactly extracting the, the echo part of that signal. 
Um, so I so I don't know the details of, of uh, the systematics or the, the the challenges in doing that. Um, uh, and in terms of the binary neutron stars for for echoes from just from the gravitational waves, uh, this is also quite challenging in that. Uh, because the binary neutron stars merge at such a high frequency relative to the sensitive band of LIGO, uh, it is difficult to do the same sort of tests that you do with the binary black holes just because of the different masses involved. It, it has been attempted. Um, the, the, the connection between observing something and it being a telltale sign of echoes is not as clear in the case of binary neutron stars. OK, thanks. I'm sorry, can I ask a question? This is not clear to me what, what you, you mean by looking for an echo in neutron star binary mergers. So what, what do you guys look for? The, the echo from the black hole that may or may not eventually form from the merger of the two neutron stars? So, uh, is, yes, is that... this, this is what has been attempted. Okay. And, and if you, for example, calculate the, 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 uh, the time that the signal is bouncing around in the cavity, how long the bounces take, you can convert that into a frequency. That 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 frequency is uh, is it, it is difficult to to measure substructure in that frequency. You can measure basically just the bounces, but not actually the uh, the echo signal itself. I see. Uh, I see. There is one last question from Caio. Uh, Oh, yes, or, just, just uh, yeah. to carry a little bit with uh, what Sebastian said. Uh, so I, I, was, I was wondering about this, this echo thing with electromagnetic signals, because if you have a, a surface or anything instead of the horizon, for instance, it doesn't, need, does, it doesn't have to be from the merging of neutron stars. So any electromagnetic signal that would enter the black hole would uh, go back as in, in the form of echoes as well. So you should be able to see some signature of uh, the would be a horizon or, or wouldn't you in this case? Yep, uh, I, I'm not an expert in the, uh, in the observational challenges of doing that with electromagnetic signals. That, that there are a lot of other electromagnetic signals going on when you have a, a binary neutron star system and extracting out exactly the uh, the echo component of that, I think, would be quite challenging. But I'm, I'm certainly not an expert and haven't looked into it in detail. OK, so I think we are OK with the questions. Thanks, Alex, again for your talk. Now we can move on to the last speaker of the day, Matthew Lewandowski, if you can share. OK, let me do this. Okay, while you share your screen, I can give a brief presentation. So Matthew is currently a postdoc in Northwestern University of Chicago. He's an expert of effective field theory of large scale structures and effective field theory of dark energy. And today he will speak about dark energy, nonlinear effects and precision cosmology. Okay, you guys can see the, the screen there? Uh, yes, I can see. Okay. Well, uh, as I said to the others, I will give you uh, five minutes a reminder before the end of the talk. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, first uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and um, all the speakers and participants for the very nice uh, conference so far. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, nonlinear effects in uh, with dark energy and with a focus here on large scale structure, but I'll, I'll also mention some other uh, nonlinear, um, interesting nonlinear effects with dark energy. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll briefly introduce the EFTs of dark energy and large scale structure. Talk about a little um, sort of grab bag of nonlinear effects like gravitational wave decay, Weinstein mechanism, positivity constraints, and um, and some recent boss analysis, old boss analysis. Um, a lot of these have been mentioned already, so I'll go quick, and then I'll, I'll talk about uh, the main part, which, which will be about consistency conditions uh, in large-scale structure, and in particular in, in dose theories of, of dark energy. So we're, of course, entering this era of precision cosmology, where we're going to have uh, a lot of data. We have uh, a bunch of telescopes in the pipelines here in the five-ish year 
timeline and we're going to measure just many, many more uh, modes and we'll have uh, precise percent level measurements. So uh, this is the time for, for, for doing cosmology. Of course, we have a lot of different questions we want to ask from, for example, a galaxy clustering map like this. We can ask about primordial non-Gaussianity, the expansion of the universe or dark energy, total neutrino masses, some kind of uh, nature of dark matter, and the effective number of neutrino species, to name a few. Of course, I'll focus here on dark energy. So the overall strategy that we have is to take a map like this, uh, which contains highly nonlinear clustering on small scales. Uh, we measure statistics on large scales, such as the two-point correlation functions, uh, which are shown here as uh, the data points on the right. And then we compare them with our theory predictions, which are the curves in these plots. So these plots here are for existing BOSS data. Um, so we should actually imagine that in the upcoming experiments, these error bars will shrink by about a factor of four or five or so. So these precision measurements will need pre precision uh, theoretical calculations. And then of course, we'd like to extract out fundamental um, physics information from these maps. Okay, so the EFT of dark energy, here's a quick uh, review. So the organizing principles for the EFT of dark energy is that we want to write down a general theory of a scalar mode that's associated with the breaking of time diffeomorphisms in the universe, so a preferred time slicing. We essentially have two scales in the problem, lambda two, which uh, describes the background expansion, which is essentially just the cosmological constant, and lambda three, which uh, defines the, the nonlinearities in, in, in the action. We've heard about these already. Um, then you could ask and start imposing uh, extra things, like you could impose that the equations of motion are second order, uh, which are Hordensky theories, or you can allow for higher derivative equations of motion, but then try to ensure that only one extra degree of freedom is propagating, and those are the dosed theories or degenerate higher order scalar tensor theories. Okay, so the construction, what we do is we start with uh, ADM parameterization of the metric, for example. We can then write down diffeomorphism invariant operators using, for example, the Riemann tensor, covariant derivatives, and the metric. But now we're also allowed to write uh, operators which break uh, time diffeomorphisms. So these are operators which are still invariant under time-dependent um, time dependent spatial diffeomorphisms, but they break the time diffs. So operators like this can be for just generic functions of time. They could be tensors uh, that have upper zero indices, or they can be um, operators that are related to the time slicing, like the three-dimensional Riemann on the surfaces of constant time, or the extrinsic curvature of those surfaces. So then what we do in order to look at what the dark energy field uh, does, and the details here are important, but there's a well-defined way of introducing uh, this dark energy field, which I'll call pi here. Um, this is not a random process. The, the interactions of pi are governed by the fact that they non-linearly realize uh, the broken time diffeomorphisms. And so they, they're introduced in, in structures like this. Um, I just want to point out here that these structures mix kind of linear and non-linear terms in, in important ways. So for example, G00, um, which could be like a linear perturbation, uh, is, is related to um, uh, d phi squared in this way. And so in, in this way, in the EFT action will have relationships between say linear or quadratic operators and, and higher order operators. And that's due to the, to the um, nonlinear realization of time diffs. Okay, so here's what the dark energy action looks like. Again, details not so important, but the ingredients that we have, we have G00, we've got delta K with again, extrinsic curvature, three-dimensional Riemann, and you can have various kinds of contractions of these uh, operators, uh, all with free coefficients in front. And for those uh, more uh, familiar with the uh, different parameterization of, of dark energy models, here, here's the connection with, um, with those alpha parameters. Okay, we can also add one more kind of operator, which is the dosed operator. 
uh, it's just has a different structure. And as we heard from, uh, for example, David uh, last week, there are some degeneracy conditions which have to be imposed so that only one degree of freedom uh, propagates. And, and here's what those look like here. Okay, so I should uh, uh, mention that um, there are um, uh, strong constraints on this dark energy actions. For example, by, by the measurement that the gravitational wave speed is very close to the uh, speed of light. And so that uh, rules out these operators here that are crossed out in red. And these two green ones uh, have to have the same coefficient. Um, and so, so it, 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 that uh, really reduces the um, parameter space. I should also mention, that, though, that as pointed out by, for example, Claudia and, and, and Scott, in some papers that the, the frequencies of these gravitational waves are near the cutoff of the EFT. And so it's not entirely clear um, exactly how seriously we should take these constraints, but for most of uh, this talk, I'll, I'll assume that these constraints hold. And then, of course, there's uh, a lot of work done on the sort of covariant formulation of, of dark energy by a lot of people, many of them who are at this um, conference, And uh, but I'll, I'll focus on the EFT um, presentation here. Okay, so now um, I'll move to large-scale structure. So just as a brief summary, uh, large-scale structure for dark matter, what we're, what we're looking at is a kind of non-relativistic subhorizon uh, fluid-like system in an expanding universe. Uh, the degrees of freedom that we write for the fluid are the um, over-density delta, which is just uh, delta rho over rho, where rho is the mass density of the fluid, and V, which is the velocity of the fluid. Um, the non-relativistic limit means that we consider small velocities. The subhorizon limit or the Newtonian limit means that we're working on scales, uh, length scales that are much smaller than, than the Hubble length. Uh, there's also a nonlinear scale in the problem, uh, which is just related to the fact that dark matter particles don't travel very far in the history of the universe. Um, so this acts as essentially the mean free path of the fluid. And then the EFT of large-scale structure will be an expansion in, in K over K nonlinear. Okay, so how do we construct the equations of motion? The equations of motion are essentially constructed by considering that they satisfy mass and momentum conservation, and then that they also have a Galilean invariance. Galilean invariance is related to, um, to a kind of non-relativistic limit of some diffeomorphisms. But in the non-relativistic limit, they show up in this way. You can shift the spatial coordinates um, and shift the fields in such a way that the, that the fluid equations are invariant. So what this looks like in the equations of motion is that time derivatives shift like this with some um, uh, transformation parameter ni. And then you have to also shift the velocity and the gravitational potential. So that essentially gives you um, uh, unique equations of motion at the lowest order. Uh, but what we do in the EFT of large scale structure is, is, is assume that there's some unknown uh, stress tensor for the fluid, which is related to short scale physics, nonlinear physics that we don't know. And we expand this uh, term in a general expansion in the long wavelength fields, which um, uh, you know, still satisfies all the symmetries uh, that we impose in the problem. So what does this look like in, um, in, in, in equations? Well, on the left here, I have the standard fluid equations. And the right is the first term that's relevant in the EFT expansion. So it's, it goes as K squared over K nonlinear squared uh, with some unknown coefficient CS squared. So this is a higher order in K over K nonlinear. Then the, the, the next terms in, in, in the stress tensor appear either at higher orders in delta or higher orders in K over K nonlinear. So we have a controlled expansion of the unknown uh, short scale physics. Okay, so what we measure in large scale structure and what we compute are correlation functions. So here the two point correlation functions at equal time of Delta defines for me the power spectrum P, the three point correlation function of Delta at equal time defines the bi spectrum B. These are the main observables. 
then just to have some picture in your head of, of what these functions look like, I plotted on the left here, the linear power spectrum P11, and on the right, the uh, correlation function, which is just the Fourier transform of, of the power spectrum. And so, and then I also took a smooth um, version of the power spectrum and subtracted it to show these wiggles that are present. And these are related to the BAO oscillations um, in the power spectrum, which appear as the BAO peak in, in the correlation function. And I'll say a bit more about the BAO later. Okay, so what do we do with these nonlinear equations? We solve them iteratively in, in perturbation theory. And you can think of this as some kind of diagrammatic expansion um, where you know, the second order solution is related to two powers of the first order solution with some integrals over Green's functions. The third order solution is three powers of the first order solution, et cetera. And then you can kind of contract these together to form the correlation functions or the power spectra, bispectra, et cetera. And so in various ways of contracting, <clears throat> you obtain diagrams that look like loop diagrams. And so we, we typically call these corrections, first order corrections, loop diagrams. Okay, so more in formulas here, um, just to show generally what these expressions look like. So these are P22 and P13 are the first order corrections to the power spectrum. There are corrections to the linear power spectrum, P11, uh, as you can see, because this is two powers of the power spectrum. And then the two loop uh, expression will be three powers of the power spectrum, et cetera. And there's some momentum depending kernels, F2 and F3, which uh, just come from the structure of the equations of motion. And, and, and there's an integral over this intermediate loop momentum. Okay, <clears throat> so now I just want to quickly kind of uh, do a sort of rapid fire round of different nonlinear effects, uh, just to collect them all together here in this talk. So I'll go pretty quickly. Most of them have already been mentioned in talks by Tony, Kazuya, and Alessandra, and uh, some will be probably mentioned later. So I'll just briefly go over them here. Okay, so looking at nonlinear effects in the dark energy, one thing that we can have is gravitational wave decay. So this operator uh, in the box here uh, contains an interaction between the graviton and, and two scalar particles. And so this can lead to gravitational wave decay. Of course, we see gravitational waves, which means that presumably they are not decaying before they get to us. And so um, this bounds uh, the parameters of the EFT of dark energy uh, fairly significantly. Um, this decay rate is uh, related to the graviton dispersion uh, by the optical theorem. And that, that can also be um, measured and constrained in, in the LIGO data. It gives a similar size constraint, 10 to the minus 10 for this combination of the parameters. Okay, then we can also talk about Weinstein, which is operating on, on small scales. Weinstein is related to this kind of nonlinear, uh, large nonlinear terms, which uh, arise around massive sources. So just as an example, writing the equation for the scalar field profile. So this X is, is like the scalar field profile. Prime here is a, a radial derivative. So there's some large, there's some nonlinear equation for X. And when the nonlinear terms become large, you're supposed to recover uh, general relativity. And you can, you can take these theories and, and bound them um, based on you know, observations that we have. So for example, inside of stars and in, inside of um, massive structures, um, we just have to demand, for example, that stars can form and exist. So it gives us some kind of bound on, on a parameter of the dark energy action. And then also outside of the stars, um, there are strong constraints from, for example, sending radio waves past the sun that the gravitational potentials phi and psi have to be very close to each other. And so that also bounds uh, the parameters. Okay, so then there's uh, positivity constraints, which is another uh, nonlinear effect. Uh, which will probably Brando will will we'll talk more about um, uh, next week and um, Asma had a talk um, 
last week um, about this, but I'll just briefly mention it here. So this is a kind of a stripped down version of, of dark energy. We have a cubic term, uh, which is like a cubic Galilean and a quartic term. And for dark energy phenomenology, essentially, we, we, like, we would like to have this kind of hierarchy between these two scales, lambda two and lambda three, such that this cubic term dominates. And this is the one that gives Weinstein and, and gives interesting effects in large scale structure. But so you can ask if this is consistent with um, having this local Lorentz invariant UV completion. And the one way to do that is to look at the scattering amplitude of this action. And the positivity arguments tell you that the S squared contribution, S squared is the center of mass energy of the, of the amplitude has to be positive. And so you can run this through the positivity arguments and de dealing with a, a kind of um, technicality that we talked about, you, you, you find that the UV cutoff of this theory would have to be very, very small. And so that's kind of tough to swallow if these kind of arguments hold. Um, so uh, we'll see how that goes. But um, I just wanna mention that if this kind of positivity arguments and the uh, arguments that Claudia made about the, the EFT, the um, gravitational wave constraints, uh, you know, being close to the cutoff, if they all hold, then in fact, large scale structure probably will become much more important for testing dark energy because that is certainly well within the EFT scales and, and doesn't run into these uh, UV problems. Okay, and then finally we have EFT of dark energy in large scale structure. So here again is the uh, uh, momentum equation for the fluid of, uh, of dark matter. And the way that dark energy comes in is through through d squared phi of the gravitational potential. It's a kind of modified Poisson equation. So for example, in Hordensky, uh, you obtain something like this. The first line here is kind of like a Poisson equation, although it is allowed to have uh, a, a different coefficient due to dark energy. But then there's also uh, nonlinear terms that enter uh, the Poisson equation. These go into the whole fluid uh, perturbation theory, and they change the, the, the signal that, that you get. Okay, so <clears throat> I just wanna drive uh, this point home about the EFT of large scale structure. And so I wanna quickly mention a recent uh, analysis um, of, of old BOSS uh, data. The details are not so important here, but basically they use the EFT of large scale structure uh, without CMB priors, and they're able to put um, competitive constraints on the cosmological parameters um, as the old boss uh, analysis, which used the Planck prior. So first of all, the EFT is able to break some degeneracies in the signals, and they're actually able to separately measure sigma eight, um, where that, that wasn't possible in, in the old analysis. And then also um, the EFT analysis has a, a stronger constraint on Hubble for example, if you do the old boss um, analysis without Planck prior. So again, imagine these error bars getting four to five times smaller. Um, you know, these kind of approaches will, will be very powerful, I think. This is also done for clustering quintessence, which uh, you know, is starting to touch the realm of, um, of dark energy. So a lot of excitement there. Okay, so I'll finally get to these consistency conditions. So consistency conditions in large scale structure are sort of intimately related with, uh, for example, Weinberg soft theorems, um, which, which relate some scattering amplitude to a scattering amplitude with an extra photon coming off, but when, when the momentum of that photon goes to zero. And so the structure is that the, the amplitude with the photon uh, in the in the soft limit is equal to some amplitude without the photon times some universal factor. Similar thing happens in Maldacena's consistency conditions, which are about the uh, inflationary perturbations zeta. So you have some three point function in the soft limit q goes to zero. It's related to a two point function, and then it's multiplied by some universal factor. 
And a similar thing will happen in large scale structure. So in large scale structure, again, we're in the non-relativistic Newtonian limit, the fluid equations. These fluid equations are invariant under these Galilean transformations, uh, which I said, and we're gonna use this to construct um, uh, new, new solutions of the equation. And that'll happen as long as this uh, gauge parameter N satisfies the linear equations of motion, basically. It, it, it ensures that the transformed solution is actually the, the long wavelength limit of a physical solution. So what are the consequences? How do we actually see what this does? So in the soft limit, again, Q much less than K, we start with an N plus one point function, take Q goes to zero. This is equal to an N point function times again, some universal factor, which comes from the symmetries. Here, D plus is the linear growth factor. It's not so important, but what's important is that at equal times, oh, I should say first that naively this contribution is scaling like K over Q and Q is going to zero. So this is potentially a large, um, a large effect. However, if we measure this correlation function at equal times, which is what we do, um, all of these D pluses come out of the sum and you just sum over the Ka, which by momentum conservation is equal to Q. And then the K over Q uh, contribution cancels. So this large contribution is not there. Um, now, there are many ways to, to prove the consistency conditions in Lambda CDM, but I want to just kind of uh, mention a sort of alternative uh, way to look at it, uh, which is not so useful in Lambda CDM for sure, but which will be useful for these dose theories that I'll discuss later. So one way to look at these transformations, which I wrote here again, is that the time derivatives of the fields have to occur in certain uh, combinations with uh, terms that have the velocity in order to be invariant. So for example, if I have a single time derivative on delta, it has to occur in this combination to be invariant under the transformation. Same with this two time derivatives, et cetera. Now for people who remember uh, fluid dynamics, this is simply the convective derivative, pretty standard in fluid stuff. But the important thing for us is that linear terms with time derivatives uh, have to be related with certain non-linear terms uh, that involve the velocity. Okay, so if we wanted to prove the consistency conditions in a kind of um, overkill way in lambda CDM, what we could do is the following. We could start with the linear equations that we have. Then we demand it be invariant under the Galilean transformations, which like I said, means that there's certain nonlinear terms have to be present in the equations of motion. So we just write them down. We don't even have to look at the nonlinear equations. Now these are only the leading contributions in the squeeze limit. That's why I have this approximate sign. And then you could do perturbation theory. You can use the Green's functions, iterate over the solutions, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to do some magic with Green's functions, integrations by parts, et cetera, et cetera, to turn this uh, sort of messy looking um, uh, kind of formal expression into a nice looking solution, uh, which is which is in fact the solution that's that's the basis of the consistency conditions. This is um, you know many factors of a long wavelength mode delta L. So these terms are going like one over Q, and then the short mode with a bunch of factors of of K. Now of course again you can do this in a much easier way by just doing coordinate transformation. Uh, it gives you the same exact answer, uh, but uh, the I think this approach is, is useful in dose theories, which we get to now. Uh, the equations, very uh, cluttery here. So I'll just draw your attention. These are the three equations you get by varying the action with respect to the gravitational potentials phi and psi and the scalar field pi. So I'll just draw your attention to what's unique in dose theories, which are these terms which appear at, with higher derivatives. So this pi appears with three derivatives on it, um, two spatial and one time derivative. But the important point is that it always appears and has the same coefficient as, a, as another strange term, uh, which has one space derivative on a pi and then three on a pi. So it's a nonlinear term, which has 
sort of, uh, instead of having two space derivatives on each, one has one derivative, one has three. Okay, so this um, structure uh, has its own kind of symmetries. And so just looking at those gravitational equations, they are invariant under a similar kind of Galilean transformation, uh, one where you shift the, the coordinate by some parameter C, and then where you shift all the gravitational potentials, phi, pi, and psi by some uh, X dependent um, uh, term here, which I call B. So in Hordensky, the Hordensky action or, or equations of motion are invariant for arbitrary Bs. And this actually allows us to prove that Hordensky theories um, do satisfy the consistency conditions. Um, however, in DOST, uh, the transformation of pi has to be related to the, the time transformation, C. And that um, is going to be the basis of this not satisfying the consistency conditions. So the system, when I couple the, the fluid equations with the gravitational potential equations, this system is invariant under a overall Galilean transformation, where I use the same parameter n to shift all the fields. Uh, and you know the, the transformations are given here. But what this allows us to do is, is define a kind of velocity of the scalar field, uh, which transforms in the same way as the velocity of the dark matter, which is just uh, basically the gradient of the scalar field. But what this means is that the relative velocity between the dark matter and the scalar field is invariant under this Galilean transformation. And so it can't be eliminated by doing a coordinate transformation. And so again, what this means is that uh, the consistency conditions can then be violated by terms that are proportional to the relative velocity, simply because we can't transform to any frame where we eliminate the relative velocity because it's invariant. Um, okay, so what does this look like? Uh, so if I imagine uh, trying to solve those long uh, dosed equations uh, for the gravitational potentials that I showed, I imagine having some kind of solutions where I'm, I'm solving for the fields on the left here. They have some uh, linear terms that start in delta with some various coefficients that depend on the dark energy parameters, and then some nonlinear uh, pieces that I could compute in perturbation theory. Now, like I said, when these time derivatives appear, I don't even have to look at exactly what these nonlinear terms are. I know that because of this Galilean invariance, the one that is uh, related to the scalar field, that, they, that these time derivatives must appear in this particular kind of convective derivative combination, uh, at least for the leading terms in the IR. And so this nonlinear part of, of, the, of the solution is just given to me for free by, by Galilean invariance. And so then I can combine the, the invariance of the fluid equations and those nonlinear terms and the invariance of the gravitational potential equations and those nonlinear terms, put them together, and just kind of write down what is the most relevant terms in this squeezed um, soft limit, IR limit. And what I get is, again, something kind of long, uh, but this uh, first line here and these ones here, these are intimately related to the lambda CDM solutions that satisfy the consistency conditions. So all that, Green's function manipulation that I was doing in lambda CDM, in fact, follows through here to these more general equations where nu and mu are not necessarily anything related to lambda CDM. They have dark energy parameters, time dependence, et cetera. But the Green's function manipulations actually go through. And, um, and so this first line in general will satisfy the consistency conditions. Now, the nice thing here about the way that I, that I wrote this is that the second line is all proportional to the relative velocity. And these are the terms that break the consistency conditions. Um, and they lead to these different coefficients in the perturbative solutions, for example, delta two and delta three, which I'm calling delta A and delta B here. So these um, non, or these terms in the equations proportional to the relative velocity 
change the form of the solutions. And these are essentially what break the, the consistency conditions. Uh, Matt, you have five minutes left. Perfect. <clears throat> so the first actual effect that I'll talk about here is uh, in the bi spectrum. Uh, this is work that I did with uh, Marco and, and Filippo. So here I'm showing the difference between the dosed bi spectrum and lambda CDM. So that the red regions here are, are large deviations from lambda CDM. Uh, specifically, I'm plotting the cross correlation between uh, two factors of the matter density and the lensing potential. So on the top plot here, uh, we have a theory which violates the consistency conditions, and we have an enhanced signal in the folded and squeezed configurations, um, which we see are not present in the bottom plot, which is a dark energy theory which does not violate the consistency conditions. So this is a kind of unique signature in the bi spectrum uh, that we can look for, which would point to a violation of the consistency conditions, which could be coming from a dark energy theory which introduces this relative velocity like dose theories. Okay, so uh, in this slide, um, looking at BAO oscillations in the squeeze limit of the bi spectrum. So I've, I've, I've subtracted out a smooth part of the bi spectrum. So this plot just focuses on the oscillations. So the configuration of the bi spectrum here is such that the squeezed limit uh, is taken by by going to larger values of K. So going to the right on the plot here. Um, so in the squeeze limit, the consistency conditions, uh, when they're satisfied, they dictate a universal behavior of the BAO oscillations. Uh, so I'm showing that by the purple uh, dashed uh, curve here. So you can see that lambda CDM, which is the blue curve, it starts off away from the squeeze limit as being different from this universal behavior. But as I go to the squeeze limit, uh, it approaches the, the purple dashed curve. Uh, and that is because it satisfies the consistency conditions. Now, this is also true for Hordensky theories. So in red, I plot uh, an example for Hordensky, which again starts off different, the signal is different than lambda CDM uh, away from the squeeze limit. But as I go to the right and I go into the squeeze limit, it also approaches the same uh, purple dashed curve. And again, that's because Wardensky uh, satisfies the consistency conditions. However, on the other hand, for dose theories, uh, they approach a different limiting behavior, uh, which, is, which are these two gray curves here, which you can see in this case have a different amplitude than, than um, lambda CDM. And this is because they violate the consistency conditions. So, for the BAO uh, in the bi spectrum um, can, can also be a powerful test uh, for violations of the consistency conditions or equivalence principle. And um, if those violations are there, they could be related to, for example, dose theories. And finally, um, I just wanna mention the one loop power spectrum of, of of dark matter um, in the presence of dosed. So here I'm showing just the IR parts of the loop. So Q much, much less than K. So this contribution in the loop is enhanced by K squared over Q squared with respect to other contributions. Um, so this could be a large contribution in the loop coming from the IR. In lambda CDM, these A and B are equal to one uh, because of the consistency conditions. And so this this term is, is absent and there's no large IR contribution. However, in dose theories, um, the, um, A and B are different from one and this contribution remains. So this is potentially catastrophic for perturbation theory because this IR piece could completely dominate the loop expansion and, and significantly lower the regime of validity of, of the EFT of large scale structure. So luckily this does not have to be the case. Uh, this integral here, um, which I call epsilon s less than, uh, because it's related to IR displacements. S stands for displacements and less than stands for IR. But anyway, it's a parameter in the loop expansion. Um, um, okay, so yeah, so this parameter could potentially be large, like I said, because it's enhanced by k, k squared over q squared. So earlier I showed that the delta A and delta B are proportional to the relative velocity. 
So this uh, part of the of, of the contribution is proportional to the power spectrum of the relative velocity. But you can ask about what about higher loops? If I go to higher loops, maybe I only get one factor of the relative velocity times other factors of just the dark matter velocity. So again, this would be a kind of catastrophic situation for perturbation theory because at some higher loop, this IR terms would, would start dominating the, the perturbation theory. Uh, but I showed here that this is not the case. And, and in fact, all higher loops, at least in this IR um, limit, are suppressed by, um, by the relative velocity power spectrum, which I represented here by lambda delta V. Um, so that's a good thing. Uh, now, the, the last thing I wanna mention is that there's kind of two parameters here. There's a dose parameter, lambda D, and a relative velocity parameter, lambda delta V. And just the point here is that you can, for example, have Hordensky theories, which have lambda D equals zero. Um, but they, they still have a large scale relative velocity. It just doesn't enter the equations in the, in the way in, as it does in dose theories. And you can also have dose theories. So where lambda D is not equal to zero, but the, where the relative velocity kind of conspires to be equal to zero. And then in those cases, you would also not have these kind of large IR effects. And so to, to conclude, I think there's lots of potential information in nonlinear effects for large scale structure and dark energy. I think the EFT of large scale structure is a promising approach to analyze upcoming surveys. And I think that large scale structure may become very important uh, in the future, especially because it is well within the regime of validity of the EFT of dark energy. And that, you know, one interesting uh, thing to look at is that some dark energy theories break the equivalence principle, but in ways in which we can uh, easily uh, calculate how. And these suggest uh, clean observables. Uh, to look at. So thank you. Uh, thank you to you, Matthew, for the very nice talk. So are there questions? Well, if nobody asks a question, I will ask it. But people are shy. So in the meantime, <laughs> yeah. ask one. <laughs> Yeah, so this EFT of dark energy you assume Lorentz symmetry, even though the background is not Lorentz symmetric because the but, but the theory is Lorentz symmetric. So what would it take to to, to actually make the theory uh, Lorentz? I mean, to, to relax, the, so, somehow you, you must make the assumption that the theory is uh, Lorentz symmetric, I guess, because in the end it's yeah. closed. But yeah, I guess, so the the situation is, is, is definitely, so in this case, yeah, we assume that uh, these time diffeomorphisms are, are, are spontaneously broken by, by some background. Mm -hmm. And so we assume that the fundamental theory is diffeomorphism invariant, fully diff invariant. Um, and, but that there's some preferred slicing in the universe, which certainly exists, the slicing where the CMB is, you know, homogeneous and where galaxy, you know, clustering is roughly homogeneous. So this is essentially a kind of a minimal, um, a minimal assumption of the, of the way that Lorentz invariants or time diffeomorphisms are broken. They're broken spontaneously by, by the existence of a background which has a preferred time slicing. Yeah, but, but then and I'm that is, and that shows up in this Stuckelberg tr mm -hmm. trick because this pi specifically only has interactions that are related to the fact that it restores the time diffs. So if you really wanted to just go to a general theory of something uh, that I guess explicitly breaks uh, the symmetries in, in, in various ways, then you could ignore the Stuckelberg formulation and just write down all the kinds of interactions of, of pi. And when you do, but when you do the calculation, you go through, you, you reinstate this, uh, the symmetry. So you never do, or do you actually do the calculation with the, the initial, uh, I mean, non diffeomorphism invariant action. I'm asking because I have in mind theories like Rojava gravity, which look like the action that you wrote in the beginning in terms of K, you know, in terms of a three plus one split. 
So is that ever used in the calculation or do you always go through when you, when you place constraints? Uh, yeah, I, for the constraints we would, well, so we assume that FRW backgrounds. Um, so we assume expanding, uh, you know, sim, sim, basically the same FRW backgrounds that we have. Um, but do you mean something more than uh, what, what we yeah, assume I the background? If I, if I could take the, the, the cosmological constraints you have uh, for, from the EFT of dark energy and apply them to, to Hojava gravity. Gotcha. Yeah, so I don't know the I don't know the details of that. So what's what's the detail where it does it breaks uh, Lorentz invariance and some it look like uh, the, this action with some I imagine some specific form for the the couplings M two and three and four, which one could and how does the scalar field enter? I mean, does it enter in the same way that it restores the the full 4D diffs, or does it enter yeah, in some? Can restore the full the, the, the 4D diff, but then the the scalar field enters. Uh, so X, yeah. So so the the, the action is not analytic uh, anymore when you express it. Ah. Uh, so it doesn't, really, and that's where you break. Um, so the kinetic energy doesn't uh, appears in some denominators, which is why. Lorentz symmetry is violated, so you don't just have. Uh, I mean, you can't. Ah, I see. But you here. presumably at low energies, you can expand this thing and and find a, a bunch of higher order operators. Is that true, or uh, it would be some specific? You can expand the denominator, and or you're saying it's actually non-analytic, like it's square root of x. Square root. Yeah, I think it's uh, yeah. It's no. There's definitely square root of x because the the um, yeah the scalar field is actually yeah, uh, must be time like, but not not just on a given background, but on any on any background. So there are yeah there are square roots of x or uh, yeah and uh, one over x. Okay. Well. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know all the details there, but I assume yeah. If there's, um, I, yeah, I guess we have assumptions of locality. Give you a generic form for this M2 and 3 and 4. I mean, yeah. there is a pipeline that can be run. To, to exactly. Use. Yeah, the only, the only issue would be if there's extra ones that, you know, that you're considering that we're not, that could have competing effects in some way that the bounds change, right? So like if, if, if there's different operators entering at the same scale, then um, yeah, then, then you might have to redo it. Uh, but in some sense, yeah, if you could map it to here, then it, then it would be, uh, it would be easy, but I, I don't, maybe if it's not analytic, you can't map it to here, but uh, I think you might be able to. Can I? Yeah, can Diego, I maybe, maybe Diego can give a more meaningful. Yeah. Yeah, well, we, we have done our Java gravity around backgrounds. That's fine. Uh, what okay. happens is that the, I mean, even if it is not analytical, uh, I mean, in the end, you you are expanding around the background. And then what happens is that some of these coefficients are fixed by a nonlinearly realized symmetry. Sorry, I'm wearing a mask now, so you cannot hear me well. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah, uh, Again, I mean, we can certainly map it to, to this, uh, but it's less, I mean, this is more general. We, we have more, constrained because of this very large uh, uh, symmetry of shift invariant of the of the scalar. Ah, okay, yeah. Okay, so you're saying, yeah, here we we, we have more operators than uh, in Herova, but presumably if we, if we impose some kind of shift symmetry on the, an extra, well, whatever the version of that symmetry is on this action, then the two would, should be in, in one yes, to one exactly. correspondent. Okay. Yeah. It, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. Uh, are there further questions? Uh, maybe I can ask a quick question. If there is yeah, time. Marco, Hi, Matt. Thanks hey. for uh, the very nice talk. And yes, so I would like to ask if, um, if you can comment about the, uh, let's say, if you can still trust the perturbation theory that you perform for large, for large case structure 
and uh, the relation with the Weinstein screening, because you know that these yeah. kind of theories, they have a, 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 um, a Weinstein radius uh, inside which you cannot trust perturbation theory and you need to consider all the nonlinearities, whereas you are considering nonlinear effect in a perturbative way. Yeah, exactly. So maybe, um, I wonder if I have, so for, I just see if I have, uh, of course I have a thousand backup slides, but none of them are the one that I want. Uh, yeah, so basically the, the assumption here is that um, if the Weinstein radius is smaller, it's typically much smaller than the scales that we actually look at for large scale structure. And so at the regime where we're doing large scale structure, the dark energy theory is, is way outside of the Weinstein radius. And so those operators, the nonlinear ones, are just starting to become important. They're not fully in the regime where the largest nonlinear operator is, is dominating. And so th this definitely assumes that uh, the, the scales at which we do large scale structure, like you know one megaparsec kind of scale, that the Weinstein radius is happening a much smaller scale. If the Weinstein radius was much bigger than that, uh, like it was much bigger than the large scale structure, uh, which would be kind of uh, wild. I, th I think things would look totally different in large scale structure. You would have uh, some kind of really strong nonlinear physics happening where where we don't see that. Uh, in the in the clustering, so it is true that those two scales can can interact with each other, but the assumption is that Weinstein is on a much smaller scale. So there is a, a limiting k in which you can trust your uh, your perturbation theory. Yeah, exactly, and 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 you know for the typical things in the universe and and their Weinstein radii, which are you know solar system to say galaxy size maybe. Um, we're still on larger scales even than that, where, where, we, where we measure uh, the galaxy clustering and can, and can do these calculations. So in that limit, yeah, we're, we're safe from, from that. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay, so I think there aren't any more questions. I think we can call it a day and thanks all the speakers again for all the very interesting talks. And I also thank all the, uh, all the participants and we'll see you tomorrow for the fifth day of the workshop. Thank and you. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>